Chapter 54. Tessa. I lie to Steph. I don't want to tell anyone about my relationship problems, especially right now, when I haven't had a chance to process what just happened. And that's exactly why I called Steph, Landon is too close to the situation, and I don't want to trouble him again. I have no other options, which is what happens when you have exactly one friend, and they happen to be your boyfriend's stepbrother. Well, ex-boyfriend, now so when Steph sounds concerned on the phone, I tell her, no, no. I'm fine. I just harden as he's out of town with his father, and he locked me out, so I need somewhere to stay until he comes home Monday. Sounds like Hardin, she says, and I feel relieved that my lie has worked. Okay, come on over. Same room as before, it'll be just like old times, she goes on cheerily, and I try to muster a little laugh. Great. Old times. I'm supposed to be going to the mall with Tristan later, but you can hang out here if you want, or come along. It's up to you. I have a lot to do to get ready for Seattle, so I'll just hang around the room, if that's all right. Sure, sure. Then she adds, I hope you're ready for your party tomorrow night. Party? I question. Oh yeah, the party. I've been so preoccupied with everything that I forgot about the party staff planned for my going away. As with Hardin's birthday party, I'm pretty sure his crew would be hanging out and drinking regardless of whether I showed up or not, but she seems like she really wants me to go and since I'm asking her this big favor, I want to be nice. One last time, come on. I know Hardin probably said no, but Hardin doesn't decide what I do, I remind her, and she laughs. I know. I'm just saying, we won't ever see each other again. I'm moving and so are you, she whines. Okay, let me think about it. I'm on my way over now, I say. But instead of heading straight to her dorm, I drive around a bit. I have to make sure I'll be able to hold myself together in front of her. No crying at all. No crying. No crying. I bite down on my cheek again to stop myself from giving in to the tears. Luckily I'm used to the pain by now. I'm practically numb to it. By the time I get to Steph's room, she's in the process of getting dressed. She's pulling a red dress down over some black fishnet stockings when she opens the door with a smile. I've missed you, she squeals and pulls me in for a hug. I nearly lose it, but I hold firm. I missed you too, even though it hasn't been that long. I smile and she nods. It feels like ages ago that Hardin and I met her at the tattoo shop, not a mere week. Guess so. It seems like it, though. She grabs a pair of knee-high boots from her closet and sits down on the bed. I shouldn't be gone too long. Make yourself at home, but don't clean anything she says, noticing the way my eyes are scanning the messy room. I wasn't going to. I lie. You so were. And you probably still will. She laughs, and I try to force myself to do the same. It doesn't work, and I end up making a noise between a snort and a cough, though fortunately she doesn't call me out on it. I already told everyone you'd be there, by the way. They were excited, she adds right as she walks out of the room and shuts the door. I open my mouth to protest, but she's already gone. This room brings back too many memories. I hate it, but love it at the same time. My old side is still empty, although staff has covered the bed in clothes and shopping bags. I run my fingers along the footboard, remembering the first time Hardin slept in the small bed with me. I can't wait to get away from this campus from this entire town and all the people in it. I've had nothing but heartbreak since the day I arrived at WCU, and I wish I'd never come in the first place. Even the wall reminds me of Hardin, and the time he tossed my notes around the room, making me want to slap him, until he kissed me, hard, up against it. My fingers move to my lips, tracing the shape of them, and they tremble at the thought of never kissing him again. I don't think I can stay in this room tonight. My mind will be reeling the entire time. Memories will be haunting me, playing behind my eyes each time they close. Needing to find something to do to keep myself distracted, I take out my laptop and try to search for somewhere to live in Seattle. Just as I suspected, it's a lost cause. The only apartment that I can find is a 30-minute ride from Vance Publishing's new office, 
and it's slightly over my budget. I save the phone number in my cell anyway. After another hour of searching, I end up swallowing my pride and call Kimberly. I didn't want to ask her if I could stay with her and Christian, but Hardin has left me no choice. Being Kimberly, of course, she happily obliges, emphasizing how delighted they'll be to host me at their new house in Seattle and bragging a little that it's even bigger than what they're in now. I promise her that I won't stay longer than two weeks, hoping to buy myself enough time to find an affordable apartment that doesn't come with bars across the windows. Suddenly I realized that with all the heart and drama I've been dealing with, I'd almost forgotten about the mess at the apartment and the fact that someone broke into it while we were gone. I'd like to think it wasn't my father, but I just don't know if I can believe that. If it was him, he didn't steal anything. Maybe he just needed a place to stay for the night and he didn't have anywhere else to go. I pray that Hardin doesn't hunt him down and accuse him of the break-in. What would be the point? Still, I probably should try to find him first, but it's getting late, and honestly, I'm a little afraid to be on that side of town alone. I wake up when Steph stumbles into the room around midnight, tripping over her own feet as she falls onto her bed. I don't remember falling asleep at the desk, and my neck aches when I lift up my head. When I run my hands over it, it hurts worse than before. Don't forget your party tomorrow, she mumbles and passes out almost immediately. I walk over and take her boots off her feet while she begins to snore, quietly thanking her for being a good friend to me and letting me stay in her room with only an hour's warning. She groans and says something incoherent before rolling over and snoring again. I've been lying in my old bed reading all day. I don't want to go anywhere or talk to anyone and I especially don't want to run into Hardin, though I doubt I would. He has no reason to be anywhere near here, but I'm paranoid and heartbroken and don't want to take any chances. Steph doesn't wake up until after 4 in the afternoon. I'm going to order pizza, do you want some? She asks, wiping last night's heavy eyeliner from her eyes with a small napkin from her purse. Yes please. My stomach growls, reminding me that I haven't eaten once today. Steph and I spend the next two hours eating and talking about her upcoming move to Louisiana and how Tristan's parents are less than pleased with him transferring schools because of her. I'm sure they'll come around, they liked you, right? I encourage her. Yeah, sort of. But his family is obsessed with WCU and something like legacy blah blah blah. She rolls her eyes, and I laugh, not wanting to explain to her what it means to families to continue a legacy. So, the party. Do you know what you're wearing yet? She asks, smiling wickedly. Or do you want to borrow something of mine for old time's sake? I shake my head. I can't believe I'm even agreeing to this, after I almost mentioned Hardin, but I redirect. After all the times you've forced me to come to these parties in the past. But it's the last one. Plus, you know you won't find anyone even remotely as cool as us to hang with at the Seattle campus. She bats her long false lashes at me, and I groan. I remember when I first saw you. I opened the door to this room and nearly had a heart attack. No offense. I smile, and she returns it. You said the parties were big, and my mother nearly passed out. She wanted me to switch rooms, but I wouldn't good thing you didn't, or you wouldn't be dating Hardin. She says with a smirk, then looks away from me. For a moment I fantasize what it would have been like if I had changed rooms and never seen him again. Despite everything we've been through, I would never want to take any of it back. Enough reminiscing, let's get ready, she cheers, clapping her hands in front of my face before she grabs me by the arms and drags me off the bed. Now I remember why I hated communal showers, I groan, while towel drying my hair. They aren't so bad. Steph laughs, and I roll my eyes, thinking about the shower at the apartment. Every single thing reminds me of Hardin, and I'm doing my best to keep this fake smile going, but inside I'm burning. Finally, my makeup applied and hair curled, Steph helps sit me into the yellow and black dress that I bought just recently. The only thing keeping me standing and present right now is the hope that the party may in fact be fun and I can have at least two hours of peace. Tristan arrives a little after 8 to pick us up. Steph refuses to let me drive, 
because she plans on having me drink until I can't see straight. Which is an idea I think I like. If I can't see straight, then I can't see Hardin's dimpled smile or scowl before me every time I open my eyes. Still, it won't stop me imagining him when my eyes are closed. Where's Hardin tonight? Nate asks from the passenger seat, and I panic momentarily. Gone. Out of town with his father, I lie. Aren't you two leaving Monday for Seattle? Yeah, that's the plan. I feel my palms beginning to sweat. I hate lying, and I'm terrible at it. Nate turns around and offers me a sweet smile. Well, good luck to both of you. Wish I could have seen him before he left. The burn increases. Thanks, Nate. I'll let him know you said that. When we pull up to the frat house, I immediately regret my decision to come. I knew this was a bad idea, but I wasn't thinking clearly and felt I needed a distraction. This isn't a distraction, however. This is one big reminder of everything I've been through and everything I've subsequently lost. It's almost humorous the way I regret coming here every single time, but somehow always end up at this damn frat house. Showtime, Steph says and hooks her arm through mine with a wild smile. For a second her eyes brighten, and I can't help but feel as if there's something else behind her choice of words. Chapter 55. Harden. When I knock on the door to my father's office, I feel nauseous. I can't believe it's come to this, to me seeking him out for advice. I just need someone to listen to me, someone who knows how I feel, or close to it. His voice sounds from inside the room. Come in, dear. I hesitate before entering, knowing this is going to be uncomfortable but necessary. I sit down in the chair in front of his large desk, watching his expression change from expectant to surprised. A little laugh escapes his mouth. Sorry, I thought you were Karen. But then, seeing my mood, he stops, watching me carefully. I nod, then look away. I don't know why I'm here, but I don't know where else to go. I lay my head in my hands, and my father takes a seat on the edge of his mahogany desk. I'm glad you came to me, he says quietly, gauging my reaction. I wouldn't exactly say I came to you, I remind him. I did in fact come to him, but I don't want him thinking this is some big revelation or some shit, even though it sort of maybe is. I watch as he gulps and nods slowly, his eyes moving everywhere in the room except to me. You don't have to be nervous. I'm not going to throw a fit or break anything. I don't have the energy. I stare at the rows of plaques on the wall behind him. When he doesn't respond, I let out a sigh. Of course that seems to prompt him, that sign of my defeat, and he says, do you want to tell me what happened? No. I don't I say and look at the books along his wall. Okay I sigh, feeling the inevitability of this moment. I don't want to, but I'm going to, I guess. My father looks puzzled for a moment, and his brown eyes widen, taking me in, watching me carefully, waiting for the catch, I'm sure. Believe me I say. If I had anyone else to go to, I wouldn't be here, but Landon is a biased asshole, and always takes her side. I know this isn't even half true, but I don't want Landon's advice right now. More than that, I don't want to admit to him what a dick I've been and the shit I've said to Tessa over the last few days. His opinion doesn't really matter to me, but for some reason it matters more than anyone else's, save Tessa's, of course. My father gives me a pained smile. I know that, son. Good. I don't know where to start, and honestly, I'm still not sure what brought me here. I had every intention of going to a bar to have a drink, but somehow I ended up pulling into my father's no, my dad's driveway. The way Tessa only says mother and father instead of mom or dad used to drive me insane. But now it's crept into my speech too. He's lucky I'm even referring to him as father or dad instead of Ken or asshole, as I've done for most of my life. Well, as you've probably guessed, Tessa finally left me, I admit, and look up at him. He does his best to keep a neutral expression while he waits for me to continue, but all I add is and I didn't stop her. You're sure she won't be back, he asks. Yes, I'm sure. She gave me multiple opportunities to stop her, and she hasn't tried to call or text in. I glance at the clock on the wall, almost 28 hours, and I don't have the slightest clue where she is. I was expecting her car, 
to be in the driveway when I arrived at Canon Karen's. I'm sure it's one of the reasons I headed over here to begin with. Where else could she even be? I hope she didn't drive all the way to her mum's house. You've done this before, though, my father begins. The two of you always seem to find a way, are you listening to me? I said she isn't coming back, I huff, interrupting him. I'm listening. I'm just curious as to what makes this time different from the others. When I glare at him, he's staring impassively at me, and I resist the urge to get up and leave his over-decorated office. It just is. I don't know how I know that, and you probably think I'm a dumbass for even coming here, but I'm tired, Dad. I'm so fucking tired of being this way, and I don't know what to do about it. Fuck. I sound so desperate and fucking pathetic. He opens his mouth a little, but he stops himself and doesn't say anything. I blame you, I go on. I really do blame you. Because if you'd been around for me, maybe you could have shown me how to I don't know, how to not treat people like shit. If I'd had a man in the house while growing up, maybe I wouldn't be such a shitty person. If I don't find some resolution for Tessa and me, I'm going to end up just like you. Well, you before you became this. I gesture to his sweater vest and perfectly pressed rest lax. If I can't find a way to stop hating you, I'll never be able to I don't want to finish the sentence in front of him. What I want to say is that if I can't stop hating him, I'll never be able to show her how much I love her and treat her the way I should, the way she deserves. My unspoken words linger there in the stuffy, wood-paneled study like a tortured spirit neither one of us knows how to exercise. You're right. He surprises me by agreeing at last. I am. Yes, you are. If you'd had a father to guide you and show you how to be a man, you'd be better equipped to handle these things and life in general. I've blamed myself for your, I watch as he struggles for the words and find myself leaning forward a little, behavior. The way you are is my fault. It all stems from me and from the mistakes I made. I'll carry the guilt for my sins for the entirety of my life and for those sins, I am so, so sorry, son. His voice catches at the end, and suddenly I feel I feel incredibly nauseous. Well, that's great, that you can be forgiven, but the result is how I am now. What am I supposed to do about it now? I pick at the torn skin around my fingernails and note that my knuckles are surprisingly not busted, for once. Somehow that takes some of the anger out of me. There has to be something, I say softly. I think you should talk to someone, he suggests. But his answer feels insufficient, and the anger flares back. No shit I should talk to someone, you don't fucking say? I wave my hand into the open space between us. What are we doing right now? We're talking. I'm referring to a professional, he replies calmly. You're holding on to a lot of anger from your childhood, and unless you find some way to let it go, or at least deal with it in a healthy way, I'm afraid you won't make any progress at all. I can't be the one to give you these tools. I caused you all this pain to begin with, and in your angrier moments you dab what I had to say, even if it was helpful. So coming here was a waste of my time, then? There's nothing you can do? I knew I should have hit the bar. I could be on my second whiskey and coke by now. It wasn't a waste of time. It was a really big step in your efforts to become a better person. He makes eye contact with me again, and I can literally taste the whiskey that I should be drinking right now instead of having this conversation. She'll be so proud of you, he adds. Proud? Why the hell would anyone be proud of me? Shocked that I'm here maybe, but proud no. She called me a drunk, I confess without thinking. Is you right? He asks, concern clear on his face. I don't know. I don't think I am, but I don't know. If you don't know, if you're a drunk, you may want to find out the answer before it becomes too late. I study my father's face and can see real fear for me behind his eyes. He has the fear maybe I should have. Why did you start drinking in the first place? I probe. I've always wanted to know the answer to that question, but I've never really felt like I could ask. He sighs and his hand moves up to smooth his short hair. Well, your mum and I weren't at the best place at the time, and... The downward spiral started when I left one night and got drunk. By drunk, I mean I couldn't even walk home, but I found 
that I liked the way I felt, immobile or not. It numbed me to all the pain I was feeling, and it became a habit after that. I spent more time at that damn bar across the street than I did with you and her. It got to the point where I couldn't function without the liquor, but I wasn't really functioning with it either. It was a losing battle. I don't remember anything before my father became a drunk. I had always assumed he was like that, since before I was born. What was so painful that you were trying to escape? That's not important. What's important is that I finally woke up one day and got sober. After you left us, I remind him. Yes, son, after I left you both. You both were better off without me. I was in no position to be a father or a husband. Your mum did an excellent job raising you, I wish she hadn't had to do it alone, but it turned out better than with me around. Anger churns and heats inside me, and I press my fingers into the armrests of the chair. But you can be a husband to Karen, and a father to Landon. There, I said it. I have so much fucking resentment toward this man who was a drunk asshole my entire life, who fucked up my life, but who manages to remarry and take on a new son and new life. Not to mention he's rich now, and we didn't have shit while I was growing up. Karen and Landon have everything that my mom and I should have had. I know it seems that way, Harden, but it's not true. I met Karen two years after I stopped drinking. Landon was already 16, and I wasn't trying to be a father figure to him. He didn't grow up with a man in the house either, so he was quick to embrace me. It wasn't my intention to have a new family and replace you, I could never replace you. You never wanted anything to do with me, and I don't blame you for that, but, son, I spent most of my life living in the dark, a blinding, desolate darkness. And Karen was my light, the way Tessa is for you. My heart nearly stops at the mention of Tessa. I was so lost in reliving my shitty childhood that I was able to stop thinking about her for a moment. I couldn't help but be happy and grateful that Karen came into my life, Landon included, Ken continues. I'd give anything to have a relationship with you the way I do with him, maybe one day that could happen. I can see that my father is out of breath after his long confession, and I'm left speechless. I've never had this type of conversation with him or with anyone in my life but Tessa. She always seems to be the exception. I don't know what to say to him. I don't forgive him for fucking up my life and choosing liquor over my mom, but I meant what I said about trying to forgive him. If I don't, I'll never be able to be normal. Really, I'm not even sure I'll ever be able to be normal anyway, but I want to be able to go a week without breaking something, or someone. The humiliation on Tess's face when I told her to leave the apartment is clear in my mind. But instead of fighting it like I always do, I embrace it. I need to be reminded of what I did to her, no more hiding from the consequences of my actions. You haven't said anything, my dad says, interrupting my thoughts. The image of Tessa's face begins to fade, and though I try to hang on to it, it slips away. The only comfort I have is in knowing that it'll be back to haunt me soon enough. I don't really know what the hell to say. This has been a lot for me. I don't know what to think, I admit. The honesty in my words terrifies me, and I wait for him to make shit awkward. But he doesn't. He just nods in agreement and stands to his feet. Karen is making a late dinner, if you want to stay. No, I'll pass, I groan. I want to go home. The only problem with home is that Tessa isn't there. And that's my own damn fault. I ran into Landon in the hallway as I was leaving, but I ignored him and left before he could try to force his unsolicited advice on me. I should have asked him where Tessa was. I'm desperate to know. But I also know myself and that I'd show up wherever she is and try to convince her to leave with me. I need to be with her wherever she is. Listening to my dad's explanation of why he was such a shitty father to me was a step in the right direction but I'm not miraculously going to be able to stop being a controlling bastard all of a sudden. And if Tessa is somewhere that I don't want her to be, like with said, for example as she with said, holy shit, would she be with him? I don't think so, but it's not like I've given her the option of having many friends. And if she isn't with Landon no, she's not with said. She's just not. I continue to convince myself of this as I ride the elevator up to our apartment. 
Half of me hopes that whoever the asshole was that broke into our apartment is back now. I could really use an outlet for my mounting anger. A chill runs down my back and over my entire body. What if Tessa had been home alone when the intruder broke in? The image of her flushed, tear-stained face from my nightmares flashes in front of me and my body goes rigid. If anyone ever tried to hurt her, it would be the last thing they ever fucking did. I'm such a fucking hypocrite. Here I am, threatening to kill someone for hurting her, when that's all I seem capable of doing. After grabbing some water and looking around the empty apartment for a few minutes, I start to get antsy. To keep myself busy, I soared through Tessa's book collection. She left too many behind, and I know it killed her to do so. Just more evidence of how toxic I am. A leather notebook hidden between two different editions of Emma catches my eye, and I run my fingers along the clasp. Pulling it out, I sift through the pages to find that Tessa's handwriting fills each page. Is this some sort of diary that I didn't know she was keeping? Introduction to World Religion is written neatly on the first page. I sit down on the bed with a book in my hands and begin to read. Chapter 56. Tessa. Logan calls to me from the other side of the kitchen, but when it's clear I can't hear him, he walks over to me. It was cool of you to come. I wasn't sure if you were going to, he says with a big smile. I wouldn't miss my own going away party, I say, tilting the red cup in my shaky hands as a sort of toast. I've missed you around here. No one has choked Molly in a while. He laughs and tips his head back, pouring clear liquor straight from the bottle down his throat. He swallows it down, blinks, then clears his throat, shaking his head in a way that makes me cringe at the thought of how bad that had to burn. You'll always be my hero for that, he teases and offers the bottle to me. I shake my head and hold up the half-empty cup in my hand. I'm sure it won't be long until someone else comes along and does it again. I take a moment to smile at the thought. Uh-oh. Speak of the devil, Logan says, his eyes focused behind me. I don't want to turn around. Why? I quietly groan, leaning one elbow on the counter. When Logan playfully offers me the bottle again, I accept it. Drink up. He smiles and walks away, leaving me with the bottle. Molly comes into my line of vision and lifts her red cup to me in greeting. As sad as I am that you're moving away, she says, her voice deceptively soft and sweet, I'm glad I won't have to see you again. I'll miss Harden, though the things that boy can do with his tongue I roll my eyes at her, while I try to think of a comeback but fail. Jealousy runs like ice through my veins, and I contemplate choking her again, right here, right now. Oh, go away, I eventually say, and she laughs. It's a hideous noise, really. Oh, come on, Tessa. I was your first enemy at college, that counts for something, right? She winks and bumps her hip into mine as she walks past me. This party was a terrible idea. I knew better than to come to this place, especially without Hardin. Steph has disappeared, and while Logan was nice enough to keep me company for a minute, he's since found a more available girl to occupy himself with. When I first see the girl, she's in profile, and she looks preppy and wholesome, but when she turns and I glimpse her from the front, I'm shocked to see that the other half of her face is full of tattoos. Ouch. I begin to wonder if they're actually permanent as I pour a little more liquor into my cup. I plan to nurse this drink all night and sip it very slowly. Otherwise the facade that I've been struggling to hold up will crumble and fall, and I'll end up being that annoying drunk girl who cries every time someone looks at her. I force myself to walk a slow lap around the house in search of Steph's crimson hair, but she's nowhere to be found. When I finally spot Nate's familiar face, I see he, too, is working on some girl, and I don't want to interrupt. I feel so out of place here. Not just because I don't exactly fit in with this crowd, but because I have this feeling that even though this party was labeled as our going away party, I don't get the sense that anyone here actually cares if Hardin and I disappear. Perhaps they'd show more interest if Hardin had actually come along with me. He is their friend, after all. After sitting alone at the kitchen counter for nearly an hour, I finally hear Steph's voice exclaim, there you are. By this point I've eaten an entire bowl of pretzels, and I'm up to two drinks. I've been debating 
whether to call a cab or not, but now that Steph has finally surfaced again, I'll try to hang in a little longer. Tristan, Molly, and Dan are behind her, and I do my best to keep a neutral expression. I miss Harden. I thought you left her something. I call over the music, distracting myself from thoughts of how wrong it feels to be here without Harden. For the past hour, I'd been battling myself to stay away from his old bedroom upstairs. I want to go in there so badly, to hide from the uncomfortable mass of people, to reminisce I don't know. I keep finding my gaze gravitating toward the stairs, and it's killing me slowly. No way. I got you a drink. Steph smiles and takes the cup that's already in my hand. She replaces it with an identical one filled with pink liquid. Cherry vodka sour, duh, she squeals at my confusion, and I force an awkward laugh out while I raise the cup to my lips. To your last party with us. Steph cheers, and multiple strangers lift their cups in the air. Molly looks away as I tilt my head back and allow the sweet cherry flavoring to flood my mouth. Talk about good timing, Molly says to Steph, and I turn around quickly. I can't decide if I want the person who's just arrived to be hardened or not, but my dilemma is settled for me when Zed walks into the kitchen dressed in all black. My mouth falls open slightly, and I turn back to Steph. You said he wouldn't be here. The last thing I need right now is another reminder of the mess I've made of my life. I said my goodbyes to Zed already and I'm not prepared to reopen the wounds that came from being friends with him. Sorry, she says with a shrug. He just showed up. I didn't know. She leans into Tristan. I give her a look emboldened by alcohol. Are you sure this party is even for me? I know I sound ungrateful, but the fact that Steph has invited Zed and Molly really bothers me. If Hardin had come, he'd have lost it for sure when Zed entered the kitchen. Of course it is. Look, I'm sorry he's here. I'll tell him to stay away from you, she assures me, and begins to walk towards Zed, but I grab her arm. No, don't. I don't want to be mean. It's fine. Zed is in conversation with a blonde girl who follows him farther into the kitchen. He's smiling down at her as she laughs, but when he looks up and notices my presence, his smile fades. His eyes dart to Steph and Tristan, but they both avoid his gaze and leave the room with Molly and Dan in tow. Once again I'm left alone. I watch as Zed leans down and says something in the blonde's ear, after which she smiles and walks away from him. Hey. He smiles awkwardly and shifts on his feet when he reaches me. Hey. I take another sip from my cup. I didn't know you'd be here, we say in unison, and then laugh uncomfortably. He grins and says, you first. I'm relieved that he doesn't seem to be holding a grudge against me. I was just saying that I had no idea you were coming. And I had no idea that you were coming either. I thought so. Steph keeps saying that this is some kind of going away party for me, but I'm positive now that she was just saying it to be nice. I take another sip. The cherry vodka sour is much stronger than the other two drinks I had. Do you're here with Steph? He asks closing the space between us. Yeah. Hardin isn't here, if that's what you're wondering. No, I his eyes move to my hand as I place the empty cup on the counter. What is that? Cherry vodka sour. Ironic, isn't it? I say, but he doesn't laugh. Which surprises me, given they're his favorite drink. Instead, his face twists in confusion as he looks from my face, back down to the cup, and up to my face again. Did Steph give you that? His tone is serious too serious and my mind is slow. Too slow. Yes yeah, so? Fuck. He snatches the cup from the counter. Stay here, he commands, and I nod slowly. I notice that my head is starting to feel kind of heavy. I try to focus on Zed as he disappears from the kitchen, but I find myself distracted by the way the lights above my head seem to be spinning round and round. The lights are so pretty so distracting in the way they're dancing on people's heads. The lights dancing? They do dance I should dance. No, I should sit down. I lean into the counter and focus on the warped wall, the way it curves and twists, blending into the lights that shine on people's heads, or are they shining on the people who are dancing? Either way it's pretty and disorienting as well, and the truth is that I'm not sure what's actually happening. 
Chapter 57. Harden. Scanning through the pages of the little notebook, I'm having a hard time deciding where to start reading. It's a journal from Tessa's religion class. It took me a minute to figure out what the hell it was, because despite the title on the front, each entry is labeled with a word and a date, most of them having nothing to do with religion. It's also less structured than the essays I've seen Tessa write, a little more stream of conscious. Pain. The word catches my eye, and I begin to read. Does pain turn people away from their God? If so, how? Pain can turn anyone away from just about anything. Pain is capable of causing you to do things you would never consider doing, such as blaming God for your unhappiness. Pain such a simple word, but so packed with meaning. I have come to learn that pain is the strongest emotion one can feel. Unlike every other emotion, it's the only one every human being is guaranteed to feel at some point in their life, and there is no upside to pain, no positive aspect that can make you look at it from a different perspective there is only the overwhelming sensation of pain itself. Lately I've become very well acquainted with pain, the ache has become nearly unbearable. Sometimes when I'm alone, which is more often than, not as of recently, I find myself trying to decide which type of pain is worse. The answer isn't as simple as I thought it would be. The slow and steady aching pain, the type of pain, that comes when you've been hurt repeatedly by the same person, yet here you are, here I am, allowing the pain to continue it never ends. Only in those rare moments, when he pulls me to his chest and makes promises that he never seems able to keep does the pain disappear. Just as I get used to the freedom, my freedom from my self-inflicted pain, it returns with another blow. This doesn't have a damn thing to do with religion, this is about me. I have decided that the hot, burning, inescapable pain is the worst. This pain comes when you finally begin to relax, you finally breathe, thinking that some issue is yesterday's problem, when in fact it's today's problem, tomorrow's problem, and the problem of every day after that. This pain comes when you pour everything into something, into someone, and they betray you so completely, so seemingly on a whim, that the pain crushes you and you feel as if you're barely breathing, barely holding on to that small fraction of whatever is left inside of you begging you to go on, to not give up. Fuck. Sometimes it's faith that people hold on to. Sometimes, if you're lucky enough, you can confide in someone else and trust them to pull you out of the pain before you dwell in it for too long. Pain is one of those hideous places that, once visited, you have to fight your way out, and even when you think you have escaped it, you find that it has permanently marked you. If you're like me, you don't have anyone to depend on, no one to take your hand and assure you that you'll make it through this hell. Instead, you have to lace up your boots, grab your own hand, and pull yourself out. My eyes moved to the date at the top of the page. This was written while I was in England. I shouldn't read any more. I should just put the damn book down and never open it again, but I can't. I have to know what else was written in this book of secrets. I fear this is the closest to her, I will fucking get any more. I turn to another page labeled Faith. What does faith mean to you? Do you have faith in something higher? Do you believe that faith can bring good things to people's lives? This should be better, this entry shouldn't twist the knife and worsen the ache in my chest. This one couldn't be related to me. To me, faith means believing in something other than yourself. I don't believe that any two people can possibly hold the same view on faith, whether their only faith is religion-based or not. I do believe in something higher, I was raised that way. My mother and I went to church every single Sunday, and most Wednesdays too. I don't go to church now, which I probably should do, but I'm still deciding how I feel about my religious faith now that I'm an adult and no longer obliged to do what my mother expects me to do. When I think about faith, my mind doesn't automatically go to religion. It probably should, but it just doesn't. It goes to him, everything does. He is my every thought. I'm not entirely sure if that's a good thing, but that's the way it is, and I have faith that it will work out for us in the end. Yes, he's difficult and overprotective, sometimes even controlling okay, he's often controlling, but I have faith in him that he means well, no matter how frustrating his actions. My relationship with him tests me in ways that I never thought imaginable, 
but every second is worth it. I truly believe that one day his deep fear of losing me will dissolve, and we will embrace our future together, that's all I want. I know he wants it too, though he would never say so. I have so much faith in that man, that I will take every single tear, every single pointless argument I'll take it all, just to be around to see him on the day, when he's able to have faith in himself. Meanwhile, I have faith, that one day Hardin will say what he feels openly and honestly, finally putting an end to himself, imposed exile from feeling things and dealing with them in the way that he should. That one day he will finally see, that he isn't a villain. He tries so hard to be one, but deep down he's really a hero. He's been my hero, my tormentor at times, but mostly my hero. He saved me from myself. I spent my life pretending to be someone I wasn't, and Hardin has shown me that it's okay to be myself. I'm no longer conforming to my mother's idea of who I am and who I'm supposed to be becoming, and I thank him dearly for helping me to get to this point. I believe that one day he will see how truly incredible he is. He's so incredibly perfectly imperfect, and I love him so much for that. He may not show the heroism inside in the conventional way, but he tries, and that's all I can ask for. I have faith that if he continues to try, he will finally allow himself to be happy. I will continue to have faith in him until he has it in himself. I close the book and pinch the bridge of my nose in an attempt to control my emotions. Tessa believes in me for no damn reason. I'll never understand why she wasted her time on me in the first place, but reading her unedited thoughts this way twists the knife in my chest, pulls it out, and then impales me with its blade once more. The realization that Tessa is just like me both frightens and thrills me at the same time. Knowing that everything in her world revolves revolved around me makes me happy, even giddy, but when I'm reminded that I fucking blew it, the happiness disappears just as fast as it came. I owe it to her and to myself to be better. I owe it to her to try to let go of my anger. Oddly enough, I feel as if a weight has been lifted from my shoulders since my awkward conversation with my father. I wouldn't go as far as to say that all the ugly, hurtful memories are forgiven, or that we'll suddenly become pals, watching sports together on TV and shit, but I do hate him less than I did before. I'm more like my father than I care to admit. I've tried to leave Tessa for her own good, but I have yet to be strong enough to do it. So, in a way, he's stronger than me. He actually left and didn't come back. If I had a child with Tessa, and I knew I would fuck up their lives, I would want to leave too. Fuck that. The thought of having a child makes me nauseous. I would be the worst possible father, and Tessa really would be better off on her own. I can't even show her love the way that I should, let alone a child. Enough of that, I say out loud and sigh, rising to my feet. I walk into the kitchen and open a cabinet. The half-empty bottle of vodka on the shelf is calling my name, begging me to open it. I really am a fucking drunk. I'm hovering over the kitchen counter with a fucking bottle of vodka in my hands. I twist the cap off and bring the bottle to my lips. Just one drink will cause the guilt to go away. With one drink I can force myself to pretend Tessa will be home soon. It's worked before to numb the pain, and it will work again. One drink. Just as I close my eyes and tilt my head back, I can see Tessa's teary eyes flashing behind mine. I open my eyes, turn on the sink faucet, and pour the vodka down the drain. Chapter 58. Tessa. Mouths are opening. Lips are moving without sounds. And the music is bouncing off of the walls, rattling my mind. How long have I been standing here? When did I walk into the kitchen? I don't remember. Hey. Dan slides in front of me, and I shudder a little, where I'm leaning against the counter. His face is a little off kilter. I stare harder, trying to bring him into focus. Hey my reply comes Sue is slow. He smiles. Are you okay? I nod. I think I do. I feel weird, sort of, I admit and scan the room for Zed. I hope he comes back soon. What do you mean? I don't know, like I feel odd. Like drunk, but slower, but then I have this energy at the same time. I wave my hand in front of my face I have three hands. Dan laughs. You must have had a lot to drink. I nod again. Look at the floor. Watch a girl cross in front of me at a snail's pace. 
Is Zed coming back? I ask him. Dan looks around. Where did he go? To find Steph about my drink. I lean farther onto the counter. Probably half of my body's on it at this point. I can't really tell. He did. Hmm, I can help you find him. He shrugs. I think I saw him go upstairs. Okay, I say. I don't think I like Dan, but I need to find Zed, because my head is getting heavier and heavier. I follow slowly behind Dan as he pushes through the crowd and heads toward the stairs. The music is amazingly loud now, and I find my head moving slowly back and forth, back and forth as I climb the steps. Is he up here? I ask Dan. Yeah. He just went in here, I think. He nods his head toward the door across the hall. That's Hardin's room, I inform him, and he shrugs. Can I just sit here for a minute? I can't walk anymore, I think. My feet feel heavy, but my mind feels like it's getting sharper, and this makes no sense to me. Sure, yeah, you can sit in here. Dan grabs hold of my arm, and leads me into Hardin's old room. I stumble to the edge of the bed, and memories seem to take shape and swirl in the air around me, Hardin and me sitting on the bed, the same spot I'm in now. I kissed him for the first time. I was so overwhelmed and confused by my growing need to be close to him. My dark boy. That was the first time I got a glimpse of the softer kinder Hardin. He didn't stay long, but it was nice to meet him. Where's Hardin? I ask, looking up at Dan. An expression crosses his face, then disappears as he chuckles. Oh, Hardin isn't here, and you said you were sure he wasn't coming, remember? He closes the door, and locks it behind him. What's going on? My mind reels with the possibilities but my body feels too heavy to move. I want to lie down, but an alarm is screeching through my head telling me to fight it. Don't lie down. Keep your eyes open. Oh, open the door, I say and try to stand, but the room begins to spin. As if on cue, there's a knock at the door. Relief floods over me, when Dan unlocks the door, and it opens to reveal Steph. Steph. I moan. He's, he's doing something. I don't know how to explain it, but I know he was going to do something. She looks at Dan, who gives her a sinister smile. Looking back at me, she asks simply, doing what? Steph I call for her again. I need her to help me leave this haunted room. Stop whining, she snaps, and I lose my breath. What? I manage to say. But Steph just smiles up at Dan, while she digs her hand through the bag she's brought in. When I'm on again, she stops and glares at me. God. Do you ever shut up? I'm so sick of hearing you bitch, and complain all the damn time. My brain isn't working correctly, Steph can't be saying these things to me. She rolls her eyes. Ugh, and that stupid innocent pout, like give it a fucking rest, already. After a couple more seconds of digging, she says, found it here, and she hands a small object to Dan. I almost fade out, but a little beat brings me back to consciousness for at least a few more seconds. I see a little red light, like a teeny tiny cherry. Like the cherry vodka sour. Steph, Dan, Molly, said. The party. Oh no. What did you do? I ask her, and she laughs again. Didn't I tell you to stop whining? You'll be fine, she groans and walks toward the bed. There's a camera in Dan's hand. The red light shows that it's on. Gee get away from me, I try to yell, but it comes out a mere whisper. I try to stand to my feet, but I stumble back to the bed. It's soft like quicksand. I thought you I begin. But Steph puts her hands on my shoulders and pushes me back against the mattress. I can't get back up. You thought what? I was your friend. She kneels on the bed, hovering over me. Steph's fingers grip the bottom of my dress and begin to pull it up my thighs. You were too busy being a whore going back and forth between Zed and Hardin to realize that I've actually always despised you. Don't you think, if I really gave a shit about you, I would have told you that Hardin was only dating you to win a bet? Don't you think a friend would have warned you? She's right, and once again my idiocy is glaringly obvious. The sting of betrayal is multiplied by the fuzziness in my head, and when I look at Steph now, the red-haired devil, her face is twisted, distorted in the most evil way imaginable and the glow of her dark eyes sends a chill through me. 
Oh, and by the way. She laughs. I hope you had fun waiting on Hardin to show up on his birthday. Amazing what I can do with one little text. So a video camera must be so much worse, huh? I try to fight her off, but it's impossible. She easily removes my fingers from where I've dug them into her arms and continues pulling on my dress. I close my eyes and imagine Hardin bursting through the door to rescue me, my knight in black armor. Hardin will find out, I threaten weakly. Ha ha, yeah, that's the point. Now stop talking. Another knock sounds at the door, and again I pointlessly try to push her off of me. Close the door, hurry, Dan says, and when I crane my neck toward the door, I'm not surprised to find that Molly has joined us. Help me get her dress off, Steph says. My eyes flutter, and I try to shake my head, but it doesn't work. Nothing works. Dan is going to force himself on me, I know it. This was Steph's plan for this party. It was never meant to be a going away party for me. It was meant to destroy me. I have no idea why I ever thought she was my friend. Molly's hair falls onto my face when she climbs onto the bed next to me and Steph pushes me up and rolls over to get better access to the back of my dress. Why why why? My voice is broken and I'm vaguely aware of the tears on my cheeks now wetting the sheets on the bed. Why? Dan echoes bringing his face close to mine. Why? Your asshole boyfriend taped himself fucking my sister, that's why. His warm breath on my face feels like mud. Whoa. Molly says loudly. I thought you said you were only taking some pictures of her. We are in maybe a little video, Steph responds. No way. Hell no, dude, you can't have him rape her. Molly shouts. He's not Jesus. I'm not, like psychotic. He's just going to touch her and make it look like they're fucking so that when Hardin sees the tape he'll fucking lose it. Just picture his face when he sees his innocent little whore of a girlfriend getting fucked by Dan. Steph laughs. I thought you were into this, she hisses at Molly. You said you were. I'm into pissing him off, but you can't take this shit. Molly is whispering, but I can hear her clear as day. You sound like her. Steph turns me back over after removing my dress completely. Stop, I whimper. Steph rolls her eyes, and Molly looks like she might vomit any second. I don't know about this anymore, Molly says, panicked. Steph grabs her shoulder viciously and points. Well, there's the door, then. If you're going to be a pussy about it, go downstairs and we'll join you in a few. Another knock at the door, and I hear Tristan's voice. Steph. Are you in there? He says through the wood. Not him too. Shit, Steph mutters. Yeah, um, I'm talking to Molly. Be out in a minute. I open my mouth to scream, but her hand clamps down over my face to silence me. It's sticky and smells like alcohol. I try to look at Molly for help, but she turns away. Coward. Go downstairs, babe. I'll be right there. She she's upset. Girl stuff, you know? She lies, and despite all of this mess, I can't help but be relieved that Tristan seems oblivious to his cruel girlfriend's intentions. Okay, he shouts. Come over here, Steph quietly instructs Dan. Then she touches my cheek. Open your eyes. They open, barely, and I feel Dan's hand trail up my thigh. Fear shoots through me, and I close them again. I'm going downstairs, Molly finally says when Dan brings the small camera in front of his face. Fine, lock the door, Steph snaps. Move over, Dan says, and the bed shifts under me when Steph climbs off and he takes her place. You hold it. I try my hardest to replace Dan's hands with Hardin's in my mind, but it's impossible. Dan's hands are soft, too soft, and I try my hardest to replace them with something, anything, I picture the softest blanket that I had as a child touching my skin the door closes, signaling Molly's exit, and I whimper again. He's going to hurt you I choke, keeping my eyes tightly closed. Nah, he won't and replies. Tessa. Zed's voice booms from somewhere, and Steph covers my mouth again as I hear pounding at the door. Keep quiet, she commands. I try to bite her hand. She reaches over and slaps me across the face but fortunately I barely feel it. Open the fucking door, Steph, 
Let me in. Zed shouts. Is he in on this too? Was Hardin right about him? Is everyone around me trying to hurt me? The thought isn't impossible, nearly everyone I've trusted, since coming to college has betrayed me. The names just keep piling up. I'll break the door, I'm not fucking around. Go get Tristan. I hear him yell, and Steph immediately removes her hand from my mouth. Wait, she yells, going to the door. But it's too late. The door bursts opens with a loud crack, and Dan's hand is no longer on me. When I open my eyes, he's backing away from me quickly as Zed strides into the room, his presence filling it. What the fuck, he yells, rushing toward me. A blanket is thrown over my body by someone as I try to reach for him. Help me, I beg him, and pray that he isn't involved in this nightmare. That he can actually hear me. He stalks towards Steph and grabs the small camera from her hands. What the hell is wrong with you? Dropping it to the ground, he stomps on it repeatedly. Chill out, dude, it was a joke, she says and crosses her arms in front of her just as Tristan enters the room. A joke? You put something in her drink, and you're up here with a video camera, while Dan tries to fucking rape her. That's not a goddamn joke. Tristan's mouth falls open. What? Ever the manipulator, Steph points an accusatory finger at Zed and starts crying on command. Don't listen to him. Zed shakes his head. No, man, it's true. Go ask Jace. She asked him for a benzo, and now look at Tessa. The camera they were using is right there. He points to the ground. Holding the blanket against me, I try to sit up again. I fail. It was a prank. No one was going to hurt her. Steph says with a fake chuckle that seems meant to hide her maliciousness. But Tristan looks at his girlfriend in horror. How could you do that to her? I thought she was your friend. No, no, baby, it's not as bad as it seems, it was Dan's idea. Dan throws his arms up, also wanting to avoid blame. What the fuck? No, it wasn't my idea. It was yours. He points to Steph and looks at Tristan. She has a fucked up obsession with Hart and it was her idea. Shaking his head, Tristan turns to leave the room, but seems to change his mind as he swings his fist through the air, connecting with Dan's jaw. Dan crumbles to the floor, and Tristan makes toward the door again. Steph starts after him. Get away from me. We're done, he yells and disappears. Circling, looking at everyone in the room, she yells, thanks a fucking lot. I want to laugh at the irony of her planning this horror show, then blaming everyone else, when it backfires in her face. And were I not lying here, catching my breath, I would laugh. Zed's face hovers above mine. Tessa are you okay? No I admit feeling dizzier than ever. At first it was only my body that was slow, my mind was clouded only slightly, but now I can feel it becoming more and more affected by the drug. I'm sorry I left you alone. I should have known better. After Zed tucks the blanket more tightly around me, one of his arms hooks under my legs, and the other settles across my back, and he lifts me from the bed. He starts carrying me out of the room, but he stops in front of Dan who is just picking himself up off the floor. I hope when Hardin finds out about what you did, he fucking kills you. You deserve it. I'm slightly aware of all the gasps and whispers going on around me as Zed carries me through the crowded house. I don't care, though. I just want to escape from this place and never look back. What the hell? I recognize Logan's voice. Can you go upstairs and get her dress and purse? Zed asks quietly. Yeah, sure, man, Logan responds. Zed backs through the front door, and cold air hits me, making me shiver. At least, I think I'm shivering, but I can't really tell. Zed tries to tighten the blanket around me, but it keeps slipping. I'm not any help, since I can barely move my arms. I'm going to call Hardin, as soon as I get you into my truck, okay? Zed says. No, don't, I groan. Hardin will be so mad at me. The last thing I want is to be screamed at when I can barely keep my eyes open. Tessa, I really think I should call him. Please, no. I begin to cry again. Hardin is the only person I want to see right now, but I don't want to know how he'll react when he finds out what happened. If he had been the one to show up instead of said, 
What would he have done to Dan and Steph? Something that would have landed him in jail, I'm sure. Don't tell him, I say again. None of it, SHHH. He'll find out anyway. Even with the video destroyed, too many people know what happened. No please. I hear Zed's frustrated sigh as he shifts my body into one arm, so he can pull the passenger door of his truck open. Logan comes back as Zed places me on the cold seat. Here's her stuff. Is he okay? He asks with obvious concern. Yeah, I think so. She's on Benzo. What the hell? It's a long story. Have you ever taken it? Zed asks. Yeah, once, but only half, and I passed out after an hour. You better hope she doesn't start hallucinating. Some people have crazy reactions to that stuff. Shit, Zed groans, and I can picture him twisting his lip ring between his fingers. Does Harden know? Logan asks. Not yet the two of them continue to discuss me, as if I'm not there, but I'm relieved when the heater in the truck finally shifts from blowing cold air to warm. I need to get her home, Zed finally says, and within seconds he's in the truck next to me. Looking at me with a worried expression, Zed says, if you don't want me to tell him, where do you want to go? You can come to my place, but you know how pissed he'll be when he finds out. If I could form an actual sentence, i tell him about our breakup, but since I can't, I make a sound that is something between a cry and a cough. Mother, I manage. You're sure? Yes, no, Harden. Please, I breathe. He nods, and the truck begins to move down the street. I try to focus on Zed's voice as he talks on the phone, but in my attempts to remain sitting up straight, I lose track of what he's said and within minutes I'm lying across the seat. Giving up, I just close my eyes. Chapter 59. Harden. Love is the single most important emotion one can hold. Whether it's your love for God or your love for another, it's the most powerful, overwhelming, incredible experience. The moment when you realize that you are capable of loving someone else more than yourself is quite possibly the most important moment in your life. It was for me, anyway. I love Harden more than myself, more than anything. My phone vibrates on the coffee table for the fifth time in the last two minutes. I finally decide to answer it, so I can tell her off. What the fuck do you want? I bark into the speaker. It's, spit it out, Molly, I don't have time for your shit. It's about Tessa. I stand to my feet, and the journal falls to the floor. My blood is ice cold. What the hell are you talking about? She's look, don't freak out, but Steph slipped her something and Anne is, where are you? The frat house. She barely gets the words out before I hang up the phone, grab my keys, and rush out of the apartment. My heart is pounding out of my chest the entire drive. Why the fuck did I get an apartment so far from the campus? This is hands down the longest 20 mile drive of my life. Steph fucking slips something to Tessa, what the fuck is wrong with her? And Anne. Fucking Dan is a dead man, if he lays one goddamn finger on her. I run every single red light, and ignore the resulting flashes, that indicate I'll be getting at least four tickets in the mail. It's Tessa Molly's voice plays over and over in my mind until I finally reach the old frat house. I don't bother turning off my car, my car is the least of my concerns right now. Crowds of drunken idiots litter the living room and hallways as I push my way through the downstairs and search for Tessa. My hands wrap around Nate's collar the moment I see him, and I slam him into the wall without a thought. Where is she? I don't know. I haven't seen her, he shouts, and I loosen my grip. Where the fuck is Steph? I demand. She's in the backyard, I think, I haven't seen her in a while. I let go of him with a shove and he stumbles forward with a glare at me. I stalk out to the backyard in a panic, if Tessa is out there in the cold with Steph and Dan Steph's red hair is bright in the darkness, and I don't hesitate to grab her collar and lift her from the ground by the back of her leather coat. She starts swatting her arms behind her. What the fuck? Where is she? I growl, keeping my fist full of the leather. I don't know, you tell me, she spits, and I turn her around to face me. Where the fuck is she? You won't do shit to me. I wouldn't doubt me, if I were you. Tell me where the fuck Tessa is, now. I scream in her face. Steph flinches, 
and her bravado falters for a moment before she shakes her head. I don't know where the hell she is, but she's probably passed out by now. You're a sick, disgusting bitch. If I were you, I would leave this place before I find Tessa. Once I know she's okay, there won't be anything stopping me from coming after you. For a moment I consider the idea of hurting Steph, but I know I couldn't actually do it. I can't imagine Tessa's reaction if I laid a hand on a woman, even an evil one like Steph. I turn on my heel and head inside. I don't have time to play games. Where's Dan Hurd? I ask a random blonde girl I see sitting. Alone at the bottom of the stairs. Him, she asks, pointing a painted fingernail toward the top of the stairs. I don't respond, but just run over and take the stairs two at a time. Dan isn't aware of my presence until I've tackled him to the ground, knocking over a couple other people along the way. I flip him over and pin him beneath me, closing my hands around his neck. Deja fucking vu. Where the fuck is Tessa? I tighten my grip. Dan's face is already turning a nice shade of pink, and he makes a pathetic choking sound instead of answering. I clamp my fingers tighter. If you hurt her in any goddamn way, I will beat every last breath from your body, I curse. He kicks his feet, and I look up at the guy he was standing with. Where is Tessa Young? I ask the kid, who just raises his hands in surrender. I don't I don't know her, man. I swear, the pussy yells, backing away as I continue to strangle his friend. Dan's face has turned from pink to purple. Are you ready to tell me? I ask. He nods frantically. Fucking talk. I shout, letting go of him. She said. He manages to mutter along with a strained and hollow sounding cough the moment I remove my hands from his neck. Said. My vision goes black as all my fears suddenly materialize. He put you up to this, didn't he? No. Zed didn't have anything to do with it, Molly says, stepping out from one of the rooms along the hallway. He didn't. I mean, he heard Steph talking about doing something, but I don't think he thought she was serious. I look at Molly with wild eyes. Where is she? Where's Tessa? I ask for the hundredth time. Each second that I don't see her, each moment that I'm not assured of her safety, is another blow to my rapidly dwindling sanity. I don't know. I think she left with said. What did they do to her? Tell me everything, now. I stand to my feet and leave Dan on the ground running his hands over his neck as he tries to catch his breath. Molly shakes her head. They didn't do anything. He stopped them before they could. He said. I went down and got him and Tristan before anything could happen. Steph was being so fucking crazy, like she was going to have Dan rape Tessa or something. She says she was only going to make it look that way, but I don't know, she was acting like a psycho. Rape Tessa? I choke out. No. Did he touch her? A little, she says sadly, and looks at the ground. I look back down at Dan, who is sitting up now. My boot collides with his cheek, and he drops back to the floor immediately. Holy shit. You're going to kill him. Molly shrieks. Like you give a fuck, I snap at her, and try to gauge just how hard I would have to kick him to permanently indent his skull. Blood trickles down his cheek and out of the corner of his mouth. Good. I don't I don't give a fuck about any of this, actually. Then why did you call me? I thought you hate Tessa. I do, trust me. But I can't sit there and let someone rape her. Well I almost thank her but I quickly remember what a bitch she is, so I just nod and walk away to find Tessa. Why was Zed here in the first place? That motherfucker always seems to show up at the right time, the exact moment, that will make me look like an asshole, and now, once again, he has saved her. Regardless of my extreme jealousy, I'm so fucking relieved to know she's away from Steph and Dan, and their fucking sick plan for revenge against me. This whole ordeal is just another reminder, that every single bad thing in Tessa's life stems from me. If I hadn't done that shit to Dan's sister, this never would have happened. Now Tessa is fucking drugged and she's with. Zed. Who knows what the fuck he'll try to do with her. This is it, this is what hell feels like. Knowing that she was in this mess because of me. She could have been raped because of me. Just like in my dreams, and I wasn't there to stop her. 
Just like I wasn't able to stop it from happening to my mom. I hate this. I hate myself so fucking much. I ruin everything and anyone that comes in contact with me. I'm poison, and she's the slowly eroding seraph, holding on to the last bit of herself that I haven't destroyed. Harden. Logan meets me at the bottom of the stairs. Do you know where Tessa and Zed are? The words taste like acid on my tongue. They left about 15 minutes ago I assume they were going back to your place he responds. So she didn't tell anyone about our breakup. Was he was he okay? I ask him and hold my breath until he responds. I don't know, she was pretty out of it. They gave her benzo. Fuck. I tug at my hair and walk to the front door. If you hear from Zed before I find them, call me I instruct him. Logan nods in agreement, and I run to my car. Thankfully no one has stolen it. However, someone has taken the opportunity to be a dick and pour a beer down my windshield and leave the empty cup on the hood. Fucking assholes. I give Tessa a call, but end up just muttering into her voicemail, answer the phone, please please just answer once. I know she probably isn't capable of answering right now, but Zed could answer the damn phone for her. The thought of her being so incoherent when I'm not around to protect her sickens me. I smash my hands against the steering wheel and peel out onto the street. This is a fucking disaster, and Tessa is with Zed, of all people. I don't trust him any more than I do Dan or Steph. That's not entirely true, but I still don't trust him. By the time I get to Zed's apartment, I'm in tears, literal tears stain and coat my cheeks, reminding me of how big of a fuck-up I really am. I let this happen, I let her get fucking drugged, nearly raped, and humiliated. I should have been there. No one would have dared to try that shit if I had been. She was probably so afraid I lift my t-shirt up to wipe my traitorous eyes and park in front of Zed's apartment. His truck isn't in the lot where the fuck is he? Where is she? I try to call Tessa, then Zed, then Tessa again, but nobody's picking up. If he does something to her while she's passed out, I will do much worse to him than he could ever imagine. Where else would she go? To Landon? Harden? Landon's sleepy voice comes through the phone, and I press the speakerphone button. Is Tessa there? He yawns. No, is she supposed to be? No, I can't find her. Are you? He stops himself. Are you okay? Yeah, no. I'm not. I can't find Tessa, and I don't know where else to look. Does she want to be found? He asks softly. Does she? Probably not. But then again, at this point she probably can't even form a coherent thought. These aren't normal circumstances, to put it mildly. I'll take your silence as a no harden. My guess is, if she doesn't want to be found, she's at the one place where she knows you won't go. Her mother's, I groan, punching my thigh for not thinking of that earlier. Oh, now I've done it are you going there? Yeah. But would Zed really drive her two hours to take her to her mum's? Do you know how to get there? Not exactly, but I can go by the apartment and get the address. I think I have something here that has it written on it, she left some transfer paperwork here a while ago. Let me look and call you right back. Thanks. I wait impatiently and turn my car around in the nearest empty parking lot. I stare out the window, taking in the darkness, fighting not to let it take me over. I have to focus on seeing Tess, on making sure she's okay. Are you going to tell me what's going on? Landon asks moments later when he calls back. Steph you know, the redeed? She drugged Tessa. Landon gasps. Wait, what? Yeah, it's a fucked up situation, and I wasn't there to help her, so she's with said, I tell him. Is he okay? He sounds like he's panicking. I don't have a fucking clue. I wipe my nose on my shirt, and Landon gives me directions to Tessa's childhood home. Her mum is going to lose her shit when I show up, especially given the situation, but I don't care. I don't have a clue as to what the hell I'm going to do when I arrive, but I have to see her and make sure she's okay. Chapter 60. Tessa. What happened? Tell me the entire story. My mother cries out as Zed lifts me out of his truck. His arms around me jar me back into consciousness and a blooming sense of embarrassment. Tessa's old roommate slips something into her drink, and Tessa asked me to bring her here, Zed tells her half-truthfully. 
I'm relieved that he kept some of the details from her. Oh my god. Why would that girl do such a thing? I don't know. Mrs. Young Tessa can explain when she wakes up. I am awake. I want to scream, but I can't. It's an odd feeling, hearing everything that's going on around me, but not being able to participate in the conversation. I can't move or speak, my mind is foggy, and my thoughts are twisted, but I'm strangely aware of everything that is happening. What's happening, though, changes every few minutes, sometimes Zed's voice turns into Hardin's, and I swear I hear Hardin's laughter and see his face when I try to open my eyes. I'm losing it. This drug is making me crazy, and I want it to stop. Some time passes, I have no idea how much, and I'm placed on what I can tell as the sofa. Slowly, maybe even reluctantly, Zed's arms slide out from underneath me. Well, thank you for bringing her here, my mother says. This is just dreadful. When will she wake up? Her voice is piercing. My head is spinning slowly. I don't know. I think the effects last 12 hours at most. It's been about three already. How could she be so stupid, my mother snaps at Zed, and the word stupid echoes in my mind until it fades out. Who, Steph, he asks. No, Teresa. How could she be that stupid to associate with those people? It wasn't her fault, Zed answers, defending me. It was supposed to be a going away party. Tessa thought the girl was her friend. Friend? Please. Tessa should know better than to try to be friends with that girl, or any of you, for that matter. No disrespect or anything, but you don't know me. I did just drive for two hours to bring your daughter here, said politely responds. My mother sighs, and I focus on the sound of her heels clicking on the tile of the kitchen floor. Do you need anything else? He asks her. The couch, I notice, is much softer than Zed's arms. Hardin's arms are soft but hard at the same time. The way his muscles drain under his skin is something I always love to watch. My thoughts are blurring again. I hate this constant shift back and forth between clarity and confusion. From a distance I hear my mother's voice say, No. Thank you for bringing her. I was rude a moment ago, and I apologize for it. I'll get her clothes and stuff from my car real quick, then be on my way. Okay. I hear the clicking of her high heels from across the room. I wait to hear the roar of Zed's truck. It doesn't come, or maybe it did already, and I missed it. I'm confused. My head is heavy. I don't know how long I've been lying here, but I'm thirsty. Did Zed leave yet? What the hell are you doing here, my mother screams, bringing a sharp edge of clarity to the haze. Though I still don't know what's happening. Is he okay? A panting, ragged voice asks. Harden. He's here. Harden. Unless it's Zed's voice deceiving me again. No, I know it's Harden. I can feel him here somehow. You weren't coming into this house, my mother yells. Did you not hear me? Don't walk past me like you didn't hear me. I hear the screen door slam shut, and my mother continues to yell. And then I think I feel his hand on my cheek. Chapter 61. Harden. They couldn't have been here long. I went 20 miles over the speed limit the whole way. The moment I spot Zed's truck in the driveway of the small brick house, I nearly vomit. When he steps out onto the porch, my vision goes red. Zed walks slowly to his truck as I park on the street, not wanting to block him in, so he can just get the fuck out of here. What will I say to him? What will I say to her? Will she even be able to hear me? I knew you'd show up here, he says quietly when I appear in front of him. Why wouldn't I? I growl, biting back my rising anger. Maybe because this is all your fault. Are you fucking serious? It's my fault, that staff is a goddamn psycho? Yes, yes, it is. No, it's your fault that you didn't come with Tessa to that party in the first place. You should have seen her face when I busted that door in. He shakes his head as if to rid himself of the memory. My chest tightens. Tessa must not have told him that we aren't together. Does that mean she's still holding on the way that I am? I, I didn't even know she was going there, so fuck off. Where is he? Inside. He states the obvious with a murderous glare. Don't fucking look at me like that, you shouldn't even be here in the first place, I remind him. If it wasn't for me, 
she would have been raped, and God knows what else, my hands find the collar of his leather jacket, and I push him up against the side of his truck. No matter how many times you try, no matter how many times you save her, she will never want you. Don't forget that. I give him one last push and step away. I want to hit him, bust his fucking nose for being such a smug asshole, but Tessa is just inside that house, and seeing her is much more important right now. As I walk past his truck windows I see on his seat Tessa's purse and dress. She doesn't have clothes on? Why is her dress off? I dare to ask. I yank on the door handle and gather her things into my arms. When he doesn't answer immediately, I glare at him, waiting for his response. They took it off of her, he simply remarks, his expression grim. Fuck, I murmur and turn to walk up the path to Tessa's mother's house. As I reach the porch, Carol comes out to block the front door. What the hell are you doing here? Her daughter's wounded, and her first thought is to scream at me. Fucking lovely. I need to see her. I grab the handle to the screen door. She shakes her head, but moves out of my way. I get the feeling that. She knows I'll push right past her. You weren't coming into this house, she shouts. I ignore her and step around her. Did you not hear me? Don't walk past me like you didn't hear me. The screen door slams somewhere behind me as I scan the small living room to find my girl. And then I freeze momentarily when I see her. She's lying on the couch with her knees bent slightly, her hair like a blonde halo around her head, and her eyes closed. Carol continues to harass me, threatening to call the cops, but I don't give a shit. I step over to Tessa, then kneel down, so that I'm level with her face. Without thought, I brush a thumb over her cheekbone and cup her flushed cheek in my palm. Christ, I curse and watch closely as her chest moves up and down slowly. Fuck, Tess, I'm so sorry. This is all my fault, I whisper to her, hoping that she can hear me. She's so beautiful, still and calm, her lips parted slightly, innocence clear on her breathtaking face. Carol of course jumps into the moment, spewing her anger at me. You've got that right. This is your fault. Now get out of my house before I have you dragged out by the police. Without turning to her, I say, would you just give it a rest? I'm not going anywhere. Go ahead and call the police. Have them show up here this late at night, you'll be the talk of the town, and we all know you don't want that. I know she's glaring at me, throwing daggers in her mind, but I can't look away from the girl in front of me. Fine, Carol finally snorts. You have five minutes. Her shoes drag against the carpet in the most hideous way. Why is she so dressed up this late anyway? I hope you can hear me, Tessa, I begin. My words are rushed, but my touch is gentle as I caress the soft skin of her cheek. Tears well up in my eyes and fall onto her clear skin. I'm so sorry. God, I'm so sorry for all of this. I shouldn't have let you walk away in the first place. What was I thinking? You would be proud of me, a little. I think. I didn't kill Dan when I found him. I only kicked him in the face oh, and I choked him a little, but he's still breathing. I paused before admitting, and I almost drank tonight, but I didn't. I couldn't make things even worse between us. I know you think I don't care, but I do, I just don't know how to show you. I stopped to examine the way her eyelids flutter at my voice. Tessa, can you hear me? I ask, hopeful said, she barely whispers, and for a moment I swear the devil is messing with my mind. No, baby, it's Hardin. I'm Hardin, not said. I can't help the irritation, that flares in me from hearing his name come so softly from her lips. No Hardin. Her eyebrows pull together in confusion, but her eyes stay closed. Said, she repeats, and I drop my hand from her cheek. When I rise to my feet, her mum is nowhere in sight. I'm surprised she wasn't hovering over my shoulder while I tried to make amends with her daughter. And then, as if my thoughts conjured her, she bursts back into the room. Are you finished? She demands. I hold one palm up toward her back. No, I'm not. I want to be, Tessa's calling out for Zed, after all. Then, meekly, as if admitting that she's not in control of the entire world, her mum asks, can you put her in her room for me before you go? She can't just lie on the couch. So I'm not allowed here, 
but I stop myself, knowing it won't do any good to get into it with this woman for the tenth time since I met her. So I just nod. Sure, where's the room? Last door on the left, she replies curtly and disappears again. I don't know where Tessa's kindness came from, but it sure as hell wasn't from this woman. Sighing, I push one arm under Tessa's knees and one under her neck, lifting her gently. A soft groan falls from her lips as I bring her close to my chest. I keep my head down slightly as I carry her down the hall. This house is small, much smaller than I had imagined. The last door on the left is nearly closed, and when I push it open with my foot, I'm surprised at the nostalgic feelings that well up deep inside me at the side of a room that I've never been in before. A small bed rests against the far wall, filling nearly half of the tiny bedroom. The desk in the corner is almost the same size as the bed. A teenage Tessa flows through my imagination, the way she must have spent hours and hours sitting at the large desk working on countless homework assignments. Her eyebrows pushed together, her mouth set in a straight over concentrated line, her hair falling over her eyes, and her hand pushing it back swiftly, before pushing the pencil back behind her ear. Knowing her now, I wouldn't have guessed these pink sheets and this purple duvet would belong to her. They must have been holdovers from back, when a younger Tessa went through her Barbie doll phase, that she once described as the best and worst time in her life. I remember her describing how she constantly felt the need to ask her mum things like where Barbie worked, what university she attended, if she would have children one day. I look down at the adult Tessa in my arms and stifle a laugh as I think about her constant curiosity, one of my most and least favorite things about her now. I yank back the blanket and gently lay her across the bed, making sure that there's only one pillow underneath her head, just the way she sleeps at home. Home this is not her home anymore. Just like this small house, our apartment was a short stop for her on the way to her dream, Seattle. The small wooden dresser creaks as I open the top drawer, searching for clothes to place on her half-naked body. The thought of Dan undressing her makes my fists clench around the thin fabric of an old t-shirt from her dresser. I lift Tessa up as gently as I can and drag the shirt over her head. Her hair is messy, and when I attempt to smooth it, it only gets worse. She groans again, and her fingers twitch. She's trying to move, and she can't. I hate this. I swallow the bile in my throat and blink away the thoughts of that shit bag's hands on her. To be respectful. I look away from her, while my hands pull her arms through the small holes and finally she's dressed. Carol is standing in the doorway. A thoughtful yet uptight expression covers her face, and I wonder how long she's been standing there. Chapter 62. Tessa. Just stop. I want to scream at the two of them. I can't keep up with them fighting this way. I can't keep up, time doesn't make sense in this state that I'm in. Everything is out of order. There are slamming doors in my mother and heart and arguing, and it's all so hard to hear, but mostly there's just darkness dragging me under, pulling hard at some point I ask Hardin, yes, what about said? Did you hurt him? At least, the thoughts are there, and I'm trying my hardest to say them. I'm not sure if they make it out of my mouth or not, if my mouth is coordinated with my mind. No, it's Hardin. I'm Hardin, not said. Hardin is here, not said. Wait, Zed is here too. Isn't he? No, Hardin, did you hurt Zed? The darkness is tugging me in the opposite direction of his voice. My mother's voice enters the room and fills it with her authoritarian air, but I can't make out a word. The only clarity I have is in Hardin's voice. Not even his words, but how it sounds, how it moves through me. At some point, I feel something push under my body. Hardin's arm? I'm not entirely sure, but I'm lifted off of the couch as the familiar minty scent fills my nostrils. Why is he here, and how did he find me? Only seconds later I'm gently laid back on the bed, then I'm lifted again. I don't want to move. Hardin's shaky hands push a shirt over my head, and I want to scream at him to stop touching me. The last thing I want is to be touched, but the moment Hardin's fingers brush against my skin, the disgusting memory of Dan is erased touch me again please. Make it go away, I beg. He doesn't. Reply. His hands keep touching my head, my neck, my hair, 
and I try to lift my hand to his, but it's too heavy. I love you, and I'm so sorry, I hear before my head rests back on the pillow. I want to take her home. No, leave me here. Please, I think to myself. But don't go chapter 63. Harden. Carol crosses her arms over her chest. Not happening. I know that, I see it and wonder, just how angry Tessa would be if I cussed her mother out. Leaving her room, her childhood bedroom, is hard enough without hearing the strangled whine that falls from her lips when I cross the threshold into the hallway. Where were you tonight, while this was happening, she questions. At home. Why weren't you there to stop this? What makes you so sure I wasn't a part of it? You're usually quick to blame me for everything wrong in the world. Because I know that regardless of your poor choices and your even poorer attitude, you wouldn't let anything like this happen to Tessa, if you could help it. Is that a compliment from her? A backhanded one, but, hell, I'll take it, especially considering the circumstances. Will I begin? She holds her hand up to silence me. I wasn't finished. I don't blame you for everything that's wrong in the world. She gestures to the sleeping, or half-conscious, girl lying on the small bed. Just her world. I won't argue with that. I sigh in defeat. I know she's right, there's no denying that I've ruined nearly everything in Tessa's life. He's been my hero, my tormentor at times, but mostly my hero, she had said in her journal. A hero? I'm far from a fucking hero. I would give anything to be one for her, but I just don't know how to go about it. Well, at least we can agree on something. Her full lips turn up in a half smile, but she blinks it away and looks down at her feet. Well, if that was all you needed, you can go. Okay I take one last look at Tessa, and then turn back to her mum, who is staring at me again. What are your plans in regard to my daughter, she asks with some authority, but also maybe a little fear. I have to know what your long-term intentions are, because every time I turn around, something else is happening with her, and not something good. What do you plan to do with her in Seattle? I'm not going to Seattle with her. The words are thick and heavy on my tongue. What? She begins to walk down the hallway, and I follow her. I'm not going. She's going without me. As happy as that makes me, may I ask why? A perfectly arched brow rises, and I look away. I'm just not, that's why. It's better for her, that I don't go, anyway. You sound just like my ex-husband. She swallows. Sometimes I blame myself for Tessa attaching herself to you. I worry that it's because of the way her father was, before he left us. Her manicured hand lifts up to smooth her hair, and she tries to appear unaffected by her mention of Richard. He has nothing to do with her relationship with me, she barely knows him. The few days they've spent together lately shows just that, she doesn't remember enough about him to affect her choice in men. Lately? Carol's eyes widen in surprise, and I watch in horror as the color drains from her face. And any small understanding we had been creating seems to disappear along with it. Shit. Fuck. Fucking shit. She um, we ran into him a little over a week ago. Richard? He found her? Her voice breaks, and she places her hand on her neck. No, she ran into him. Her fingers start running nervously over the pearls around her neck. Where? I don't think I should be telling you any of this. Excuse me? Her arms drop, and she stands there gaping in shock. If Tessa wanted you to know that she'd seen her dad, she would have told you herself. This is more important than your dislike for me, Harden. Has she been seeing him often? Her gray eyes are now glazed over, threatening to spill tears at any moment, but knowing this woman, she would never in a million years shed a tear in front of anyone, especially me. I sigh, not wanting to betray Tessa, but reluctant to cause any more shit with her mum. He stayed with us for a few days. She wasn't going to tell me, was she? Her voice is thin and hoarse while she picks at her red fingernails. Probably not. You are the easiest person to talk to, I remind her. I wonder if this is a good time to bring up my suspicion about him breaking into the apartment. And you are? She raises her voice, and I step closer. At least I care about her well-being. That's more than I can say for you. I knew the civil conversation between us wouldn't last long. I care about her more than anyone, even you. 
I fire back. I am her mother. No one loves her more than I do. The fact that you think you possibly could just shows how demented you really are. Her shoes click against the floor as she paces back and forth. You know what I think? I think that you hate me, because I remind you of him. You hate the constant reminder of what you ruined, so you hate me, so you don't have to hate yourself, but do you want to know something? I wait for her sarcastic nod before continuing, you and I are a lot alike too. More alike than Richard and I, really, we both refuse to take any responsibility for our mistakes. Instead we blame everyone else. We isolate the ones we love and force them, no. You're wrong, she cries out. Her tears and histrionics somehow keep me from finishing that thought that she will spend the rest of her days alone. No, I'm not wrong. But what I am is leaving. Tessa's car is still around school somewhere, so I'll bring it back tomorrow, unless you want to make the drive yourself. Carol wipes at her eyes. Fine, bring the car. At five tomorrow. She looks up at me through bloodshot eyes and smeared mascara. That doesn't change anything. I'll never like you and I'll never care if you do. I walk toward the front door, momentarily debating whether I should go back down the hallway, get Tessa, and bring her with me. Hardin, despite the way I feel toward you, I do know that you love my daughter. I just want to remind you again that, if you love her, truly love her, you will stop interfering in her life. She's not the same girl that I dropped off at that devil school half a year ago. I know. As much as I hate this woman, I feel pity for her, because, like me, she'll probably be alone for the rest of her miserable life. Can you do me a favor? I ask. She eyes me suspiciously. What would that be? Don't tell her that I was here. If she doesn't remember, don't tell her. Tessa is so out of it, she probably won't remember a thing. I don't think she even knows that I'm here now. Carol looks at me, looks through me, and nods. That I can do. Chapter 64. Tessa. My head is heavy, so heavy, and the light shining through the yellow curtains is bright, too bright. Yellow curtains? I reopen my eyes to find the familiar yellow curtains of my old bedroom covering the windows. Those curtains always drove us both crazy, but my mother couldn't afford to buy a matching set, so we learned to live with them. And the last 12 hours come flooding back in pieces, broken and jumbled memories that make little sense to me. Nothing makes sense. It takes seconds, minutes maybe, for my mind to even attempt to comprehend what happened. Steph's betrayal is my strongest memory from the night, one of the most painful memories I have ever had to experience. How could she do that to me? To anyone? The whole situation is just so wrong, so twisted, and I never saw it coming. I remember the strong sense of relief I felt when she walked into the room, only to slip back into a panic when she admitted she had never been a friend to me after all. Her voice was so clear, despite the state I was in. She put something in my drink to slow me down, or worse, to make me pass out, all so she could get some sort of unwarranted revenge on me and Harden. I was so afraid last night and she went from being my safety to being a predator so quickly that I could barely comprehend the shift. I was drugged at a party by someone who I thought was my friend. The reality of this hits me hard, and I swipe angrily at the tears soaking my cheeks. Humiliation replaces the sting of betrayal when I remember Dan and his camera. They took off my dress the small red camera light in the dim room is something I don't think I'll ever forget. They wanted to violate me, tape it, and show it to an audience. I hold my stomach, hoping to not get sick, again. Every single time I think I may get a break from the constant battle that has become my life, something worse happens. And I keep putting myself in these situations. Steph, of all people? I still can't grasp it. If your reasoning was true, if she did it, only because she doesn't like me, and she has a thing for Hardin, why didn't she just tell me in the first place? Why did she pretend to be my friend all this time, only to set me up? How could she smile in my face and go shopping with me, listen to my secrets and share my worries, only to be planning something like this behind my back? I sit up slowly, and it's still too fast. My pulse is pounding behind my ears, and I want to rush to the bathroom and force myself to throw up, in case any of the drug remains in my stomach. I don't, though, 
and instead close my eyes again. When I wake up again, my head is a little lighter, and I manage to get out of my childhood bed. I don't have any pants on, only a small t-shirt that I don't remember putting on in the first place. My mother must have dressed me, but that doesn't seem likely. The only pajama pants left in my old dresser are uncomfortably tied and too short. I have gained weight since I left for college, but I feel more comfortable and confident in my body more now than I ever felt before. I wobble out of the bedroom, down the hallway, and to the kitchen, where I find my mother leaning against the counter, reading a magazine. Her black dress is smooth and lint-free, her matching heels are high, and her hair is curled into perfect, classic waves. When I glance at the clock on the stove, I see that it's a bit past four in the afternoon. How are you feeling? My mother asks timidly as she turns to face me. Terrible, I groan, unable to put on a friendly, much less a brave face. I'd imagine, after the night you had. Here we go, have some coffee and some Advil. You'll feel better. I nod slowly and walk over to the cabinet to grab a coffee mug. I have church this evening. I assume you won't be coming along? Do you miss the morning service? She says in a flat voice. No. I'm in no shape to be in church right now. Only my mother would ask me to go to church with her when I just woke up after sleeping off a date rape drug. She grabs her handbag from the kitchen table, then turns back to me. Okay, I'll tell Noah and Mr. and Mrs. Porter you said hello. I'll be home around 8, maybe shortly after. A pang of guilt hits me at the mention of Noah's name. I still haven't called him since I learned of his grandmother's passing. I know I should have, and I need to. I'll do it after church ends. If I can find my phone, that is. How did I get here last night? I ask, trying to put the pieces of the puzzle together. I remember said storming into Hardin's old room and breaking the camera. The young man who brought you was named said, I believe. She looks back down at her magazine and quietly clears her throat. Oh. I hate this. I hate not knowing. I like to be in control of everything, and last night I wasn't in control of my thoughts, or of my body. My mother puts down the magazine with what sounds like a slap. She looks at me blankly, says, call me if you need anything, and walks toward the front door. Okay turning, my mother gives one last disapproving glance toward my tight pajamas and leaves the house. Oh, and go through my closet, and find yourself something to wear. The moment the screen door closes, a flash of Hardin's voice pops into my mind. This is all my fault, he said. It couldn't have been Hardin, my mind is playing tricks on me. I need to call said and thank him for everything. I owe him so much for coming to my aid, for saving me. I'm so grateful to him and I'll never be able to thank him enough for helping me and driving me all the way here. I can't imagine what would have happened in front of that camera had he not shown up. Salty tears mix with black coffee for the next half hour. Finally, I force myself from the table and into the bathroom to wash last night's disgusting events from my body. By the time I'm searching in my mother's closet for something without a built-in underwire bra, I feel a good deal better. Do you not own any normal clothing? I groan, pushing through hanger after hanger holding cocktail dresses. I'm at the point where I would rather sit naked before I finally find a cream-colored sweater and dark jeans. The jeans fit perfectly, and the sweater is tied on my chest, but I'm grateful to have found anything casual at all, so I'm not going to complain. Searching the house for my phone and purse, I realize that I don't have a single memory that could point me toward their hiding place. Why can't my mind just clear through the jumbled night and make sense of everything? I'm assuming my car is still parked outside of Staff Storm, Hopefully she hasn't slashed my tires. I go back into my old bedroom and pull open the desk drawer. My phone sits inside, on top of my small purse. I press the power button and wait for the home screen to appear. I nearly turn it back off when the alert vibrations go on endlessly. Text message after text message, voicemail after voicemail, pop onto the small screen. Harden Harden Zed Harden Unknown Harden Harden My stomach flutters in the most uncomfortable way as I read his name on the screen. He knows. He has to. Someone told him what happened, and that's why he called and text messaged me so many times. 
I should call him, and at least, let him know that I'm okay, before he worries himself crazy. Regardless of the state of our relationship, he's probably upset, after hearing about what happened upset being an understatement, for sure. I hang up the phone after six rings, just as his voicemail picks up, and head back into my mother's bedroom to attempt to style my hair. The last thing I care about is my appearance right now, but I also don't care for the idea of listening to my mother's insults, if I don't make myself look at least decent. Dealing with my appearance also helps to distract me from my anxiety over the scattershot memories of last night that flash into my mind occasionally. I cover the deep circles under my eyes and apply a few swipes of mascara and brush my hair. It's nearly dry now, working in my favor as I rake my fingers through the natural waves. It doesn't look nearly as good as I would like, but I don't have the energy to mess with the frizzy mess any longer than I already have. The faint sound of someone knocking at the front door draws me out of my daze. Who could be coming here at this time? And suddenly my stomach turns at the thought of Hardin being on the other side of the door. Tessa, a familiar voice calls as I hear the door open. Noah lets himself in, and I see him in the living room. Relief and guilt hit me as I take in his familiar but shaky smile. Hey he nods, shifting from one foot to the other. Without thinking, I practically throw myself at him, wrapping my arms around his neck. I bury my face in his chest and begin to cry. His strong arms wrap around me and hold me, keeping both of us from toppling over. Are you okay? Yes, I'm just no, I'm not. I lift my head from his chest, not wanting to smear my mascara on his tan cardigan. Your mom said you were in town. He continues to hold me, while I continue to relish the familiarity of him. So I kind of ducked out before the service ended, so I could say hey without everyone around. So what happened? So much, too much to even explain. I'm being so dramatic, I groan and step away from him. College still isn't treating you the way you hoped, he asks with a sympathetic little smile. I shake my head and gesture for him to follow me into the kitchen, where I make another pot of coffee. No, not at all. I'm moving to Seattle. Your mom told me, he says and sits at the table. Are you still thinking of going to WCU in the spring? I bark out a little laugh. I wouldn't recommend that school. But trying to make a joke at my own expense fails as tears fill my eyes. Yeah, that's the plan. This girl I've been seeing we've been thinking about San Francisco, though. Do you know how I love California? I wasn't prepared for that, Noah dating someone. I suppose I should have been, but it feels so weird that all I can think to say is, oh? Noah's blue eyes shine under the fluorescent kitchen lights. Yeah, it's been going pretty well. I've been trying to take it in stride, though, you know because of everything. Not wanting him to finish that thought and make me feel even more guilty about how we broke up, I ask, um, so how did you two meet? Well, she works at Zooms or something, a store in the mall near you, and you were in town? I interrupt him. It feels strange that he didn't tell me, didn't stop by, but I get it. Yeah, to see Becca. I should have called you or something, but everything was so weird between us I know. It's okay, I assure him and let him finish. That name, Becca, rings a bell, but the fragment of memory drops from my mind as he continues. Well, anyway, I guess after that, we got pretty close. We had some problems here and there, and I thought I couldn't trust her for a while, but we're doing pretty good now. Hearing about his woes brings me back to my own, and I sigh. I feel like I can't trust anyone anymore. When Noah frowns, I hastily add, except you. I'm not talking about you. Every single person that I've met since I arrived at that school has lied to me in some way. Even Hardin. Especially Hardin. Is that what happened last night? Sort of I wonder what my mother told him. I knew it had to be something big to bring you home. I nod, and he reaches across the table to clasp my hands in his. I missed you, he murmurs, sadness clear in his voice. I look up at him with white eyes. I can feel the tears coming again. I'm so sorry that I haven't called about your grandma. It's okay, I know you're busy. He leans back against the chair with soft eyes. That's not an excuse, I've been so terrible to you. You haven't, he lies, 
shaking his head slowly. You know that I have. I've treated you so poorly since I left home, and I'm so sorry. You didn't deserve any of it. Stop beating yourself up. I'm okay now, he assures me with a warm smile, but the guilt doesn't subside. I still shouldn't have done it. Then he surprises me with something I wouldn't have expected him to ever ask. If you could do it all over again, what would you change? The way I went about things. I shouldn't have strung you along and gone behind your back. I've known you half my life and I dropped you so suddenly, it was terrible of me. It was, he starts, but I get it now. We weren't good for each other well, we were perfect together, he says with a laugh. But I think that was actually the problem. The small kitchen feels more spacious now as my guilt begins to dissolve. Do you think so? Yeah, I do. I love you, and I'll always love you. I just don't love you the way I always thought I did, and you could never love me the way you love him. I choke on my breath at his mention of Hardin. He's right, he's so right, but I can't talk about Hardin with Noah. Not right now. I need to change the subject. So Becca makes you happy, then? Yeah, she's different than you'd probably expect, but then, Hardin isn't exactly who I expected you to break up with me for. His smile isn't harsh as he chuckles softly. I guess we both needed something different. He's right, yet again. I guess so. I laugh along with him, and we continue to lighten the conversation until another knock at the door interrupts us. I'll get it, he says, standing to his feet and leaving the small kitchen, before I can stop him. Chapter 65. Hardin. Watching the clock change from minute to minute, is slowly murdering me. I'd rather pull my hair out piece by piece than sit here, and wait in this goddamn driveway until 5. I don't see Tessa's mum's car. There are no cars in the driveway except Tessa's, which I'm sitting in. Landon has parked on the street, having followed me here, so I get a lift back. Luckily he cares about Tessa's well-being more than anyone except me, so it didn't take any convincing. Go knock on the door, or I will, he threatens through the phone. I'm going to. Fuck, give me a second. I don't know if anyone's here. Well, if not, leave the keys in the mailbox, and we'll go. That's exactly why I haven't done that already, I want her to be inside. I have to know that she's okay. I'm going up now, I say and hang up on my obnoxious stepbrother. The 17 steps up to her mum's front door are the worst of my life. I knock on the outer screen door, but I'm not sure if it was loud enough. Fuck it. I knock again, this time much harder. Too hard, too hard. I put my hand down when the flimsy aluminum bends, snapping a couple pieces of wire from the screen. Shit. The door creaks open, and instead of Tessa, her mom, or anyone else on the fucking planet that I'd rather see, it's Noah. You've got to be fucking kidding me, I say. When he tries to close the door in my face, I stop it with my boot. Don't be a dick. I push the door open, and he steps back. Why are you here, he asks, his face etched in a deep scowl. I should be asking him why the fuck he is here. Tessa and I haven't been separated three days, and here this asshole is, worming his way back into her life. To drop her car off. I look behind him, but I can't see shit. Is he here? The entire way here, I told myself that I didn't want her to see me or remember that I was at her house at all last night, but I know I was just bullshitting myself. Maybe. Does she know you're coming? Noah crosses his arms, and it takes every bit of self-control I have not to knock him to the ground, step over him, maybe on him, and find her. No. I just want to make sure that she's okay. What did she? Tell you? I ask him, backing back off of the porch. Nothing. She didn't have to. She doesn't have to tell me anything. I know she wouldn't come all the way here if you hadn't done something to her. I frown. You're wrong, actually. It wasn't me this time. He looks surprised by my small admission, so I continue, peacefully, for now. Look, I know you hate me, and you have every reason to, but I will see her one way or another, so you can either move out of my way or I'll, Hardin. Tessa's voice is a small whisper, nearly lost in the breeze, as she appears behind Noah. Hey my feet carry me inside the house, and Noah sensibly moves out of my way. Are you okay? I ask, 
cupping her cheeks in my cold hands. Her head jerks away, because of the cold, I force myself to believe, and she steps back from me. Yeah, I'm okay, she lies. Questions tumble out of my mouth. Are you sure? How are you feeling? Did you sleep? Does your head ache? Yes, okay, some, yes, she answers, nodding along, but I already forgot what I asked her in the first place. Who told you, she asks me, her cheeks a deep red. Molly. Molly? Yeah, she called when you were um, in my old room. I can't keep the panic from my voice. Oh she looks past me, focusing on some distant space, her eyebrows drawn together in concentration. Does she remember, that I was here? Do I want her to? Yes, of course I do. You're okay, though? Yes. Noah steps to where we're standing, and with alarm clear in his voice asks, Tessa, what happened? Looking back at Tessa, I can tell she doesn't want him to know about everything. I like the idea of that more than I should. Nothing, don't worry about it, I answer him, so she doesn't have to. Was it serious? He presses. I said, don't worry about it, I growl, and he gulps. I turn back to Tessa. I brought your car, I tell her. You did, she says. Thanks, I thought Steph would have busted the windshield or something. She sighs, her shoulders slouching further with every word. Her attempt at a joke didn't work for anyone, herself included. Why did you go to her, anyway? Out of all people, why her? I ask her. She looks at Noah, then back to me. Noah, can you give us a minute, she sweetly requests. He nods and gives me what I assume is supposed to be some kind of warning glare before leaving us alone in the small living room. Why her? Tell me please, I repeat. I don't know. I didn't have anywhere else to go, Harden. You could have gone to Landon. You practically have your own bedroom at that house, I point out. I don't want to keep dragging your family into it. I've done it enough, and it's not fair to them. And you knew I would go there? When she looks down at her hands, I say, I wouldn't have. Okay, she says sadly. Fuck, that's not what I meant. I didn't mean it like that. I meant I was going to give you space. Oh, she whispers while picking at her fingernails. You're being really quiet. I'm just I don't know. It's been a long night and morning. She frowns. I want to walk over and smooth the line between her brows and kiss her pain away. No Hardin, said, she called out in her barely conscious state. I know, do you remember it? I ask her, not sure if I can bear to listen to her response. I expect her to tell me to go away, or cuss me out even, but she doesn't. Instead she nods and sits down on the couch, gesturing for me to sit on the other side. Chapter 66. Harden. I want to move closer to her, to reach for her shaking hand, and find a way to erase her memories. I hate that she went through such an ordeal, and I'm once again blown away by her strength. She's sitting up, her back as straight as a board, and ready to talk to me. Why did you come here? She asks quietly. By way of answer, I ask, why is he here, and nod my head toward the kitchen. I just know Noah is perched against the wall, listening into our conversation. I really can't fucking stand him, but given the circumstances, I should probably shut up about it. Playing with her hands, she says, he's here to check on me. He doesn't need to check on you. That's why I'm here. Harden, she frowns, not today. Please. Sorry I inch back, feeling like an even bigger asshole than I did seconds ago. Why did you come here? Tessa asks again. To bring your car. You don't want me here, do you? I haven't once, until now, even considered that possibility. And it burns through me like acid. My being here might only be making things worse for her. The days of her finding solace in me are no longer. It's not that I'm just confused. About what? Her eyes shine under the dim lights of her mum's living room. You, last night, Steph, everything. Did you know that it was all a game to her, and she really has hated me all this time? No. Of course I didn't know, I tell her. You had no idea that she had any bad feelings toward me? Damn it. But I want to be honest, so I say, maybe a little, I guess. Molly had mentioned it once or twice, 
but she didn't elaborate, and I didn't think it was something to this extent, or that Molly even knew what she was talking about. Molly? Since when does Molly care about me? So black and white. Tessa always wants things to be so black and white, and it makes me shake my head, a little sad, that things just can never be so simple. She doesn't, she hates you still, I tell her and look down. But she called me after that Applebee's shit, and I was mad. I didn't want her, or Steph to ruin things between me and you. I thought Steph was trying to meddle, just to be a nosy bitch. I didn't think she was a fucking psycho. When I look over at Tessa, she's wiping tears from her eyes. I move across the couch, to close the space between us, and she recoils. Hey, it's okay, I say and grab her arm to pull her to my chest. SHHH my hand rests over her hair, and after a few seconds of trying to pull away, she gives in. I just want to start over. I want to forget about everything that's happened in the last six months, she sobs. My chest tightens as I nod along, agreeing with her, even though I don't want to. I don't want her to want to forget me. I hate college. I always look forward to it, but it's been one mistake after another for me. She pulls at my shirt, bringing herself closer to me. I stay silent, not wanting to make her feel any worse than she's already feeling. I didn't have a fucking clue of what I was walking into when I knocked on the door, but I sure as hell didn't expect to have a crying Tessa in my arms. I'm being so dramatic. She pulls away too soon, and for a moment I consider pulling her back to me. No. No, you're not. You're being really calm, considering what happened. Tell me what you remember, don't make me ask again. Please. It's all a blur really, it was so strange. I was aware of everything but nothing made any sense. I don't know how to explain it. I couldn't move, but I could feel things. She shudders. Feel things? Where did he touch you? I don't want to know. My legs they undressed me. Only your legs? Please say yes. Yes, I think so. It could have been so much worse, but said. She stops. Takes a breath. Anyway, the pills made my body so heavy I don't know how to explain it. I nod. I know what you mean. What? Broken memories of blacking out in bars and stumbling down the streets of London race through my mind. The idea of fun, that I once had, is completely different from what I consider to be fun now. I used to take them now, and then for fun. You did. Her mouth falls open, and I don't like how her look makes me feel. I guess fun isn't really the word, I backtrack. Not anymore. She nods and gives me a sweet, relieved smile. She adjusts the collar of her sweater, which I see now is pretty tight on her. Where did that come from? I ask. The sweater? She gives me a wry smile. It's my mother's can't you tell? Her fingers tug at the thick fabric. I don't know. Noah was at the door, and you're dressed like that I thought I had stepped into a time machine, I tease. Her eyes light up with humor, all sadness momentarily washed away, and she bites down on her lip in an attempt to stop from laughing. She sniffles and reaches over to the small table to pull a tissue from the floral box. No. There are no time machines. Tessa shakes her head back and forth slowly, while wiping at her nose. Fuck, even after crying she's so damn beautiful. I was worried about you, I tell her. Her smile disappears. Fuck. This is what confuses me, she says. You told me you didn't want to try anymore, but here you are telling me that you were worried about me. She stares at me blankly, her lip trembling. She's right. I don't always say it, but it's true. I spend hours a day worrying about her. Emotion this is what I need from her. I need the reassurance. But she takes my silence the wrong way. It's okay, I'm not upset with you. I do appreciate you coming here and bringing my car. It means a lot to me that you did that. I remain mute on the couch, unable to talk for some time. It's nothing, I finally managed to say with a shrug. But I need to say something real, anything. After watching more of my painful silence for a moment, Tessa goes into polite hostess mode. How will you get home? Wait how did you even know how to get here? Shit. Landon. He told me. Her eyes light up again. Oh, he's here? Yeah, he's outside. 
She flushes and rises to her feet. Oh. I'm keeping you, I'm sorry. No, you aren't. He's fine out there waiting, I stammer. I don't want to leave. Unless you're coming with me. He should have come inside. She glances toward the door. He's fine. My voice comes out much too sharp. Thank you again for bringing my car she's trying to dismiss me in a polite way. I know her. Do you want me to bring your stuff inside? I offer. No, I'm leaving in the morning, so it's easier to keep it in there. Why does it surprise me that every single time she opens her mouth, she reminds me that she's going to Seattle. I keep waiting for her to change her mind, but it will never happen. Chapter 67. Tessa. As Hardin reaches the door, I ask, what did you do about Dan? I want to know more about last night, even if Noah can hear us talking. As we pass him in the hallway, Hardin doesn't so much as look at him. Noah glares, though, unsure of what to do, I assume. Dan. You said Molly told you. What did you do? I know Hardin well enough to know that he went after him. I'm still surprised by Molly's help. I was far from expecting it when she walked into the bedroom last night. I shudder at the memory. Hardin half smiles. Nothing too bad. I didn't kill Dan when I found him. I only kicked him in the face you kicked him in the face I say, trying to dig through the mess in my head. He raises a brow. Yeah did Zed tell you that? I, I don't know I remember hearing the words, I just can't remember who said them. I'm Hardin, not Zed, Hardin said, his voice in my mind feels so real. You were here, weren't you? Last night? I step toward him. He backs into the wall. You were, I remember it. You said you were going to drink, and you didn't I didn't think you remembered, Hardin mutters. Why wouldn't you just tell me? My head aches, while I struggle to separate drug-induced dreaming from reality. I don't know. I was going to, but then everything got so familiar, and you were smiling, and I didn't want to ruin it. He shrugs one shoulder, and his eyes focus on the large painting of the golden gates of heaven on my mother's wall. How would you telling me that you drove me home ruin it? I didn't drive you home. Zed did. I remembered that earlier, sort of. This is so frustrating. So you came after? What was I doing? I want Hardin to help me put together the sequence of events. I can't seem to do it on my own. You were lying on the couch. You could barely speak. Oh you were calling out for him, he adds quietly, venom laced through his deep voice. For who? Zed. His answer is simple but I can feel the emotion behind it. No, I wasn't. That doesn't make sense. This is so frustrating. I sift through the mental mud and finally find a lump of sense Hardin speaking about Dan, Hardin asking me if I can hear him, me asking him about said I wanted to know about him, if you had heard him. I think. The memory is fuzzy, but it's there. You said his name more than once. It's okay. You were so out of it. His eyes drop to the carpet and stay there. I didn't expect you to want me anyway. I didn't want him. I may not remember much, but I was afraid. I know myself enough to know that I would only call for you, I admit without thinking. Why did I just say that? Hardin and I broke up, again. This is our second actual breakup, but it feels like there have been so many more. Maybe because this time I haven't jumped into his arms at the slightest sign of affection from him. This time I left the house and the gifts from Hardin. This time I'm leaving for Seattle in less than 24 hours. Come here, he says, holding his arms open. I can't. I take a page from his book and run my fingers over my hair. Yes, you can. Whenever Hardin is around me, despite the situation, the familiarity of him always seeps into every fiber of my being. We either scream at each other or we smile and tease. There's never any distance, no middle ground between us. It's such a natural thing for me now, an instinct really, to let myself find comfort in his arms, laugh at his stale attitude, and ignore the issues that caused us to be in whatever terrible situation that we were in at the time. We aren't together anymore, I say quietly, more to remind myself. I know. I can't pretend that we are. I pull my bottom lip between my teeth and try not to notice the way his eyes dull at the reminder of our status. I'm not asking you to do that. 
All I'm asking is for you to come here. His arms are still open, still long and inviting, calling for me, pulling me closer and closer. And if I do, we'll only fall back into repeating the cycle that we both decided to end. Tessa Hardin, please. I back away. This living room is much too small for me to avoid him, and my self-control is faltering. Fine. He finally sighs, and his hands tug at his hair, his usual sign of frustration. We need this, you know that we do. We have to spend some time apart. Some time apart? He looks wounded, pissed off, and I'm a little afraid of what will come out of his mouth next. I don't want to fight with him, and today isn't the day for him to try to start one. Yes, some time alone. We can't get along, and everything seems to always be working against us. You said yourself the other day that you were sick of it. You keep me out of the apartment. I cross my arms in front of my chest. Tessa you can't be fucking, he looks into my eyes and stops mid-sentence. How much time? What? How much time apart? I, I didn't expect him to agree. I don't know. A week? A month? He pushes for specifics. I don't know, Harden. We both need to get ourselves to a better place. You're my better place, Tess. His words swarm through my chest, and I force my eyes to move from his face before I lose whatever resistance I have left. You're mine too, you know you are, but you're so angry, and I'm always on edge with you. You have to do something about your anger, and I need time to myself. So this is my fault, again, he asks. No, it's me too. I'm too dependent on you. I need to be more independent. Since when does any of this matter? The tone of his voice tells me that he hasn't ever considered my dependency on him a problem. Since we had that massive blow up at the apartment a few nights ago. Actually, it started a while ago. Seattle and the argument the other night were just the icing on the cake. When I finally gather the courage to look up at Hardin, I see that his expression has changed. Okay. I get it, he says. I'm sorry, I know I fuck up a lot. We've already beaten the Seattle thing into the ground, and maybe it's time that I start listening to you more. He reaches for my hand, and I let him take it, momentarily baffled by his newfound agreeability. I'll give you some space, okay? You've dealt with enough shit in the past 24 hours alone. I don't want to be another problem for once. Thank you, I respond simply. Can you let me know when you get to Seattle? And get some food in your stomach, and rest please. His green eyes are soft, warm, and comforting. And I want to ask him to stay, but I know it's not a good idea. I will. Thank you really. You don't have to thank me. His hands push into the tight pockets of his black jeans, and his eyes measure my face. I'll tell Landon you said hello, he says and walks out the door. I can't help but smile at the way he lingers by Landon's car, staring at my mother's house for a long beat, before getting into the passenger seat. Chapter 68. Tessa. The moment that Landon's car is out of sight, the emptiness weighs heavy on my chest, and I step back from the entryway letting the door close. Noah is leaning against the threshold between the living room and kitchen. Is he gone? He asks gently. Yeah, he's gone. My voice is distant, unfamiliar even to myself. I didn't know you guys weren't together. We well we're just trying to figure everything out. Can you tell me one thing before you change the subject? His eyes scan my face. I know that look, you're about to find a reason to. Even after the months we've been apart, Noah still reads me so well. What do you want to know? I ask. His blue eyes stare into mine. He holds my gaze for a long time, a bravely long time. If you could go back, would you, Tessa? I heard you say you want to erase the last six months, but if you could, would you, really? Would I? I sit down on the couch to ponder his question. Would I take it all back? Erase everything that's happened to me in the last six months? The bet, the endless fights with Hardin, the downward spiral of my relationship with my mother, Steph's betrayal, all the humiliation, everything. Yes. In a heartbeat. Hardin's hand on mine, the way his inked arms wrapped around me, pulling me to his chest. The way he sometimes laughed so hard that his eyes would pinch closed and the sound would fill my ears, my heart, 
and the entire apartment with such a rare happiness that I felt more alive than I'd ever felt before. No. I wouldn't. I couldn't, I say, changing my answer. Noah shakes his head. Which is it? He chuckles and sits on the recliner across from the couch. I've never known you to be so indecisive. I shake my head firmly. I wouldn't erase it. You're sure? It's been a bad year for you and I don't even know the half of it. I'm sure. I nod a couple of times, then take a seat on the edge of the couch. I would do some things differently, though, with you. Noah gives me a slight smile. Yeah, me too, he quietly agrees. Teresa. A hand grasps my shoulder and shakes me. Teresa, wake up. I'm up. I groan and open my eyes. The living room. I'm in my mother's living room. I kick a blanket off my legs a blanket Noah covered me with when I lay down after we talked a bit more and then started to watch some TV together. Just like old times. I wriggle out of my mother's grip. What time is it? 9 p.m. I was going to wake you up earlier. She purses her lips. It must have been driving her insane to let me sleep the day away. Oddly, the thought amuses me. Sorry, I don't even remember falling asleep. I stretch my arms and stand to my feet. Did Noah leave? I peer into the kitchen, and I don't see him. Yes. Mrs. Porter really wanted to see you, but I told her it wasn't a good time, she says and goes into the kitchen. I follow her, smelling something cooking. Thank you. I do wish I'd said a proper goodbye to Noah, especially because I know I'll see him again. My mother goes to the stove and says over her shoulder, Hardin brought your car, I see, disapproval coloring her voice. A moment later, she turns from the stove and hands me a plate of lettuce and grilled tomatoes. I haven't missed her idea of a good meal. But I take the plate from her hand anyway. Why didn't you tell me that Hardin came here that night? I remember it now. She shrugs. He asked me not to. Taking a seat at the table, I poke at the meal tentatively. Since when do you care what he wants? I challenge, nervous about a reaction I don't, she says and prepares her own plate. I didn't mention it, because it's in your best interest not to remember. My fork slips from my fingers and hits the plate with a sharp clink. Keeping things from me isn't in my best interest, I say. I'm doing my best to keep my voice cool and calm, I really am. To emphasize this, I dab the corners of my mouth with a perfectly folded napkin. Teresa, do not take your frustrations out on me my mother says, joining me at the table. Whatever that man has done to make you this way is your own fault. Not mine. The moment her red lips pull into a confident smirk, I stand from the table, throw my napkin onto the plate, and storm out of the room. Where are you going, young lady, she calls. To bed. I have to get up at four in the morning, and I have a long drive ahead of me, I yell down the hallway and close the door to my bedroom. I take a seat on my childhood bed, and immediately the light gray walls seem to be closing in on me. I hate this house. I shouldn't, but I do. I hate the way I feel inside it, like I can't breathe without being scolded or corrected. I never realized how caged and controlled I had been my entire life until I had my first taste of freedom with Hardin. I love having pizza for dinner, spending the entire day naked in bed with him. No folded napkins. No curled hair. No hideous yellow curtains. Before I can stop myself, I'm calling him, and he's answering on the second ring. Tess, he says, out of breath. Um, hey, I whisper. What's wrong, he huffs. Nothing, are you all right? Come on, Scott. Get back over here, a female voice says in the background. My heart starts hammering against my ribcage as the possibilities flood my mind. Oh, you're I'll let you go. No, it's fine. She can wait. The background noise gets softer and softer by the second. He must be walking away from whoever she is. Really, it's okay. I'll just go, I don't want to interrupt you. Looking at the gray wall nearest my bed, I swear it's crept closer to me. Like it's ready to pounce. Okay, he breathes. What? Okay, bye, I say quickly and hang up, holding my hand over my mouth, to keep from vomiting on my mother's carpet. There has to be some sort of logical, my phone buzzes next to my thigh, 
Hardin's name clear on the small screen. I answered despite myself. I'm not doing what you think I'm doing I didn't even realize how it sounded, he immediately states. I can hear a harsh wind blowing around him, muffling his voice. It's okay, really. No, Tess, it wouldn't be, he says, calling me out. If I was with someone else right now, that wouldn't be okay, so stop acting like it would be. I lie back on the bed, admitting to myself that he's right. I didn't think you were doing anything, I half lie. I somehow knew he wasn't, but my imagination it took me there still. Good, maybe you finally trust me. Maybe. Which would be much more relevant, if you hadn't left me. His tone is sharp. Harden he sighs. Why did you call? Is your mum being a bitch? No, don't call her that. I roll my eyes. Well she kind of is being one, but it's nothing big. I'm just I don't know why I called, really. Well he pauses, and I hear a car door shut. Do you want to talk or something? Is that okay? Can we? I ask him. Only hours ago I was telling him that I needed to be more independent, yet here I am, calling him the moment I'm upset. Sure. Where are you, anyway? I need to keep the conversation as neutral as possible, not that it's ever possible to keep things between Hardin and me neutral. A gym. I almost laugh. A gym? You don't go to the gym. Hardin is one of the few people to be blessed with an incredible body without ever having to work out. His naturally large build is perfect, tall with broad shoulders, even though he claims that he was lanky and thin as a young teenager. His muscles are hard. But not too defined. His body is the perfect mixture of soft and hard. I know. She was kicking my ass. I was genuinely embarrassed. Who? I say a little forcefully. Calm down, Tessa, it's obviously the woman whose voice you heard. Oh, the trainer. I decided to use that kickboxing shit you got me for my birthday. Really? The thought of hard and kickboxing makes me think about things that I shouldn't be thinking about. Like him sweating yeah, he says, a little shyly. I shake my head to try to cast out the image of him shirtless. How was it? Okay, I guess. I prefer a different type of exercise. But on the plus side, I'm a lot less tense than I was a few hours ago. I narrow my eyes at his response, even though he can't see me. My fingers trace the flower print fabric of the comforter. Do you think you'll go again? I finally feel like I can breathe as hard and begins to tell me about how awkward the first half hour of his session was, how he kept cursing at the woman until she slapped him across the back of his head, repeatedly, which, in turn made him respect her and stop being such a jerk to her. Wait. I finally speak. Are you still there? No, I'm home now. You just left? Did you tell her? No, why would I, he asks, as if people acted like him all the time. I like the idea that he dropped what he was doing just to talk to me on the phone. I shouldn't, but I do. Which warms me, but also makes me sigh and say, we are doing a very good job on this space thing. We never do. I can picture his smirk, even though he's speaking from more than a hundred miles away. I know, but, this is our version of space. You didn't get in the car and drive here. You only called. I guess so I allow myself to agree with his twisted logic. In a way, though, he's right. I don't know, yet if it's a good or a bad thing. Is Noah still there? No, he left hours ago. Good. I'm looking at the darkness beyond the ugly curtains of my room, when Hardin laughs and says, talking on the phone, is so fucking weird. Why? I ask. I don't know. We've been talking for over an hour. I pull my phone from my ear to check the time, and sure enough, he's right. It doesn't seem that long, I say. I know, I never talk to anyone on the phone. Except when you call me to bother me about bringing something home or a few calls to my friends, but they never last longer than like two minutes. Really? Yeah, why would I? I was never into the teenage dating shit. All my friends used to spend hours on the phone listening to their girlfriends, go on about nail polish, or whatever the fuck girls talk about for hours on end. He laughs lightly, and I frown a little at the reminder that Hardin never got the chance to be a normal teenager. You didn't miss out on much, I assure him. 
Who did you used to talk to for hours? Noah? Spitefulness is clear in his question. No, I never did that talking for hours thing either. I was busy shoving my nose into novels. Perhaps I was never a true teenager either. Well, I'm glad you were a nerd, then, he says, making my stomach flutter. Teresa. I'm snapped back into reality as my mother repeatedly calls for me. Oh, is it past your bedtime? Harden teases. Our relationship, non-relationship, giving each other space, but talking on the giving each other space, but talking on the phone thing, has become even more confusing within the last hour. Shut up, I respond and cover the receiver long enough to tell my mother I'll be right out. I need to see what she wants. You're really going tomorrow? Yeah, I am. After a moment of silence, he says, okay, well, be safe I guess. I can call you in the morning? My voice is shaky as I offer. No, we probably shouldn't do this again, he says, and my chest tightens. Well, not often, anyway. It doesn't make sense to talk all the time, if we aren't going to be together. Okay. My response sounds small, defeated. Good night, Tessa, he says, and then the line goes dead. He's right, I know he is. But knowing that doesn't make it hurt any less. I shouldn't even have called him in the first place. Chapter 69. Tessa. It's 15 minutes until 5 o'clock in the morning, and for once my mother isn't dressed for going out. She's wearing a silk pajama suit and has her robe wrapped around her, matching slippers covering her feet. My hair is still damp from my shower, but I've taken the time to apply some makeup and decent clothing. My mother studies me. You have everything you need, correct? Yes, everything I have is in my car, I say. Okay, be sure to get gas before you leave town. I'll be fine, mother. I know. I'm only trying to help. I know you are. I open my arms to hug her goodbye, and when she gives me a stiff little embrace, I pull back and decide to pour myself a cup of coffee for the road. That small silly hope still nags at me, the foolish part of me that wishes so badly that headlights will appear in the darkness, Hardin will climb out of the car, bags in hand, and tell me that he's ready to go to Seattle with me. But that foolish part of me is just that, foolish. At 10 minutes after 5, I give my mother one last hug and climb into the car, which fortunately I had the foresight to warm up with the heater on. Kimberly and Christian's address is programmed into the GPS on my phone. It keeps closing down and recalculating, and I haven't even left the driveway. I really do need a new phone. If Hardin were here, he'd remind me repeatedly that this is another reason to get an iPhone. But Hardin's not here. The drive is long. I'm just at the beginning of my adventure, and already a thick cloud of unease is forming within me. Each small town that I pass makes me feel more and more out of place, and I wonder if Seattle will feel even worse. Will I settle in there, or will I run back to the main WCU campus, or even to my mother's place? When I check the clock on my dashboard, I see it's only been an hour. Although, as I think about it, the hour did pass pretty quickly, which, in an odd way, makes my mind begin to feel lighter. When I look again, 20 minutes have passed in a blink. The farther I get from everything, the lighter my mind feels. I'm not controlled by panic thoughts as I drive down the dark and unfamiliar roads. I focus on my future. The future that no one can take from me, that no one can make me give up. I stop frequently for coffee, snacks, and just to breathe in the morning air. When the sun finally comes up halfway through my drive, I focus on the bright yellow and orange light it casts in the way the colors blend together, making a beautiful, bright new beginning to the day. My mood lightens with the sky, and I find myself singing along to Taylor Swift and tapping my fingers on the steering wheel as she talks about trouble walking in, and I laugh at the irony of the lyrics. As I pass the sign welcoming me to the city of Seattle, my stomach fills with butterflies, the good kind. I'm doing this. Teresa Young is now officially in Seattle, making a life for herself at an age when most of her friends are still trying to figure out what they want to do with their lives. I did it. I didn't repeat my mother's mistakes and rely on other people to carve my future for me. I had help, obviously, 
and I'm grateful for it, but it's up to me now to take it all to the next level. I have an amazing internship, a sassy friend and her loving fiancé, and a car full of my belongings. I don't have an apartment I don't have anything except my books, the view boxes in my backseat, and my job. But it will work out. It will. It has to. I will be happy in Seattle it'll be just like I had always imagined it to be. It will. Every single mile drags on and on every second, is filled with memories, goodbyes, and doubts. Kimberly and Christian's house is even larger than I had expected from Kimberly's description. I'm nervous and intimated by the driveway alone. Trees line the property, the hedges around the house are well manicured, and the air smells of some flower I don't quite recognize. I park behind Kimberly's car and take a deep breath before climbing out. The large wooden door is crested with a large V, and I'm giggling at the arrogance of such a decoration, when Kimberly opens the door. She raises her eyebrow to me, and follows my eyes to the door she's just opened. We didn't put that there. I swear, the last family, that lived here was named Vermin. I didn't say anything, I inform her with a shrug. I know what you're thinking. It's hideous. Christian is a proud man, but even he wouldn't do such a thing. She taps the letter with her red fingernail, and I laugh again as she ushers me inside. How was the drive? Come in, come in, it's cold out there. I follow her into the foyer, and welcome the warm air and sweet smell of a fireplace. It was okay long, I tell her. I hope I never have to make that drive again. She scrunches up her nose. Christian's at the office. I took the day off to make sure you get settled in. Smith will be home from school in a few hours. Thank you again for letting me stay. I promise I won't be here longer than two weeks. Don't stress yourself. You're finally in Seattle. She beams, and at last it hits me, I am in Seattle, Chapter 70. Harden. How was the kickboxing yesterday? Landon asks, his voice strained, his face contorted into a stupid-looking expression of physical effort as he lifts, yet another bag of mulch. When he drops it into place, he puts his hands on his hips, and says with a dramatic eye roll, you could help, you know. I know, I say from the chair I'm sitting on, and prop my feet up on one of the wooden shelves inside Karen's greenhouse. Kickboxing was okay. The trainer was a woman, so that was fucking lame. Why? Because she kicked your butt? Do you mean my ass? And no, she did not. What made you go, anyway? I told Tess not to buy you that pass to the gym, because you wouldn't use it. Annoyance flares in my chest at the way he called her Tess. I don't like it one fucking bit. It's only Landon, I remind myself. Of all the shit I have to worry about right now, Landon is the least of my concerns. Because I was enraged, and I felt like I was going to break everything in that goddamned apartment. So when I noticed the voucher as I was pulling out all of the drawers in the dresser, I grabbed it, put my shoes on, and took off. You pulled out all the drawers? Tess is going to kill you. He shakes his head and finally takes a seat on the stack of mulch bags. I don't know why he agreed to help his mum move all this shit around, anyway. She won't see it, it's not her place anymore, I remind him, trying to keep the edge out of my voice. He looks at me guiltily. Sorry. Yeah. I sigh. I don't even have a witty comeback. It's hard for me to feel bad for you, when you could be there with her, Landon says after a few beats of silence. Fuck you. I lean my head back against the wall, and I can feel him staring at me. It doesn't make sense, he adds. Not to you. Or her. Or anyone. I don't have to explain myself to anyone, I snap. Then why are you even here? Instead of answering him, I look around the greenhouse, unsure of what I'm doing in this place myself. I don't have anywhere else to go. Does he think that I don't miss her every fucking second? that I wouldn't much rather be with her than standing here talking to him? He gives me a sideways look. What about your friends? You mean the one who fucking drugged Tessa? Or the other one who set me up in order to tell her about the bet? I start counting them on my fingers to add to the dramatic effect. Or you could mean the one who is constantly trying to get into her pants. Shall I go on? Guess not. Though I could have told you that your friend sucked he says in an annoying tone. So what are you going to do? 
deciding that keeping the peace is better than murdering him, I just shrug. Exactly what I'm doing now. So you're going to hang out with me and mope around? I'm not moping. I'm doing what you told me to do and bettering myself, I mock, using air quotes. Have you talked to her since she left? I ask. Yeah, she texted me this morning to tell me she arrived. She's advances, isn't she? Why don't you find out for yourself? Fuck, Landon is annoying. I know she is. Where else would she be? With that Trevor guy, Landon is quick to suggest. And his smirk makes me reconsider the stay of execution I had just granted him. If I tackled him, it wouldn't hurt much. He's only about three feet off the ground anyway. It probably wouldn't even leave a bruise I forgot about fucking Trevor, I groan, rubbing harshly at my temples. Trevor is almost as infuriating as said. Only, I believe that Trevor does actually have good intentions when it comes to Tessa, which only upsets me even more. It makes him more dangerous. So what's next in Project's self-improvement? Landon smiles, but it fades quickly, and his expression turns serious. I'm really proud of you for doing this, you know. It's nice to see you actually trying for once, instead of making an effort for an hour, then going back to the way you were the moment she forgives you. It'll mean a lot to her to see you really following through on these changes. I drop my feet and rock in the chair slightly. Talking like this is stirring something up in me. Don't try to lecture me. I haven't done shit yet. It's only been a day. A long miserable lonely day. Landon's eyes go white in sympathy. No, I'm serious. You didn't turn to alcohol, and you haven't gotten into a fight, you haven't been arrested, and I know you came to talk to your dad. My mouth drops open. He told you? That fucker. No, he didn't tell me. I live here, and I saw your car. Oh I think you talking to him really would mean a lot to Tessa, he continues. Would you just stop? I say, imploring him with a quick hunch of my shoulders. Fuck. You're not my shrink. Stop acting like you're better than me, and I'm some damaged fucking animal that you need to, why can't you just graciously accept a compliment? Landon says over me. I never said I was better than you. All I'm trying to do is be there for you as a friend. You don't have anyone, you said it yourself, and now that you let Tessa move to Seattle, you don't have a single person to give you moral support. He stares at me, but I look away. You have to stop pushing people away, Harden. I know you don't like me, you hate me, because you think I'm somewhat responsible for some of the issues you have with your dad, but I care deeply for Tessa and you, whether you want to hear that or not. I don't want to hear it, I fire back at him. Why does he always have to say shit like this? I came here to I don't know, talk to him. Not to talk to him, not to have him tell me how much he cares about me. And why would he care about me, anyway? I've been nothing but an asshole to him since the day I met him, but I don't hate him. Does he really think that I do? Well, that's one of those things you need to work on. He stands to his feet and walks out of the greenhouse, leaving me alone. Fuck. I keep my foot out in front of me, and it collides with a wooden shelving unit. A crack sounds through the room and I jump to my feet. No, no, no. I try to catch the flower boxes, clay pots, and random shit before they crash to the floor. Within seconds, all of it, the pieces of all of it, is on the floor. This isn't fucking happening. I didn't even mean to break this shit, and here I am with a pile of dirt, flowers, and cracked pots at my feet. Maybe I can clean some of this shit up before Karen oh my, I hear her gasp and I turn to the doorway to see her standing there, a little trowel in her hand. Fugue. I didn't mean to knock them down, I swear. I keep my foot out and accidentally broke the shelf, and all this shit started falling down, and I tried to catch it. I frantically explain as Karen rushes over to a pile of broken pottery. Her hands sift through the rubble, trying to piece together a blue flower pot that has no chance of ever becoming one again. She doesn't say anything but I hear her sniffle, and she lifts her arm to wipe her cheeks with her dirt-covered hands. After a few seconds, she says, I've had this pot since I was a little girl. It was the first pot I ever used for transplanting a cutting. I, I don't know what to say to her. Of all the shit I've broken, this time it truly was an accident. 
I feel like complete shit. This and my china were the only things of my grandmother's that I had left, she cries. The china. The china that I smashed into a million pieces. Karen, I'm sorry. I, it's okay, Harden. She sighs, tossing the pieces of the flower pot back into the pile of dirt. But it's not okay, I can see it in her brown eyes. I can see how hurt she is, and I'm surprised by the heaviness of the guilt I feel pressing on my chest at the sight of the sadness in her eyes. She stares at the shattered pot for a few more seconds, and I watch her silently. I try to imagine Karen as a young girl, big brown eyes and a kind soul even at that point. I bet she was one of those girls who was nice to everyone, even the assholes like me. I think about her grandmother, probably nice like her, giving her something that Karen felt was important enough to keep safe all these years. I've never had anything in my life that wasn't destroyed. I'm going to finish dinner. It'll be ready soon, she says at last. Then, with a wipe of her eyes, she leaves the greenhouse the same way her son left only minutes ago. Chapter 71 Tessa. There's no denying Smith and his adorable little way of walking around, looking at things, greeting you with a formal handshake, and then drilling you with questions as you try to do chores. So when I'm putting away my clothes, and he waddles in, and asks me in a quiet voice, where's your heart in? I can't really be upset. It makes me a bit sad to have to say that I left him back at WCU, but the cuteness of this little kid eases some of that pain. And where's WCU, he asks. I do my best to smile. It's a long way away. Smith bats his beautiful green eyes. Is he coming? I don't think so. Um, you like Hardin, don't you Smith? I laugh and push the sleeves of my old maroon dress over a hanger and place it inside the closet. Sort of. He's funny. Hey, I'm funny too. I tease, but he only smiles a shy smile. Not really, he answers bluntly. Which only makes me laugh harder. Hardin thinks that I'm funny, I lie. He does? Smith follows my actions and begins to help me unpack and refold my clothes. Yes, he won't admit it, though. Why? I don't know. I shrug. Probably because I'm not very funny, and when I try to be funny, it's even worse. Well, tell your Hardin to come here and live like you, he says very matter-of-factly. Like a little king issuing an edict. My chest tightens at the sweet little boy's words. I'll tell him. You don't have to fold those, I tell him, reaching for a blue shirt in his small hands. I like to fold. He hides the shirt back behind him, and what can I do but not? You'll make a good husband one day, I tell him, and smile. His dimples show when he smiles back. At least he seems to like me a little more than he did before. I don't want to be husband, he says, scrunching up his nose, and I roll my eyes at this five-year-old who speaks exactly like a grown man. You'll change your mind one day, I tease. Nope. And with that he ends the conversation, and we finish with my clothes in silence. My first day in Seattle is coming to a close, and tomorrow will be my first day at the new office. I'm extremely nervous and anxious about it. I don't care for new things. In fact, they terrify me. I like to be in control of every situation and enter new environments with a solid plan. I haven't had time to plan much about this move, save enrolling into my new classes, and honestly, I'm not looking forward to them as much as I should be. Somewhere in the middle of my scolding myself, Smith has disappeared, leaving a perfectly folded pile of clothing on the bed. I need to get out and see Seattle tomorrow after work. I need to be reminded of what I loved so much about this city, because right now, in this strange bedroom, hours away from everything I've ever known, it just feels so lonely. Chapter 72. Harden. I watch Logan down the entire pint of beer, foamy head and all. Put the glass on the table and wipe his mouth. Steph's a psycho. No one knew she was going to do that to Tessa he says. And then burps. Dan knew. And if I find out that anyone else did I warn him. He looks at me solemnly and nods. No one else knew. Well not that I know of. But you know no one tells me shit anyway. A tall brunette appears at his side, and he slides his arm around her. Nate and Chelsea will be here soon, he says to her. 
A couple's night, I groan. Time for me to go. I move to stand, but Logan stops me. It's not a couple's night. Tristan is single now, and Nate isn't dating Chelsea. They're just fucking. I don't know why I came here anyway, but Landon would barely speak to me, and Karen looks so sad at dinner, I just couldn't sit there at the table any longer. Let me guess. Zed will be here, too? Logan shakes his head. I don't think so. I think he was even. More pissed than you about the shit that went down, because he hasn't spoken to any of us since then. No one is more pissed than me, I say through my teeth. Hanging out with my old friends isn't helping me better myself. It's only making me annoyed. How dare anyone say that Zed cares more about Tessa than I do. Logan waves his hand in the air. I didn't mean it like that my bad. Have a beer and chill out. He looks around for the bartender. I look over and see that Nate, she who must be Chelsea, and Tristan are walking across the floor of the small bar toward us. I don't want a fucking beer, I say quietly, trying to control my attitude. Logan is only trying to help, but he's annoying me. Everyone is annoying me. Everything is annoying me. Tristan smacks me on the shoulder. Long time no see, he tries to joke, but it's only awkward, and neither of us even cracks a smile. I'm sorry about the shit that Steph did, I had no idea what she was up to, honest, he finally says, making it even more awkward. I don't want to talk about it, I say forcefully, closing the conversation. While the small group of my friends drinks and talks about shit that I give absolutely no fuck about, I find myself thinking about Tessa. What is she doing right now? Does she like Seattle? Does she feel as uncomfortable at Vance's house as I suspect she does? Are Christian and Kimberly being nice to her? Of course they are. Kimberly and Christian are always nice. So really, I'm just avoiding the big question, does Tessa miss me the way I miss her? Are you going to have one? Nate interrupts my thoughts and waves a shot glass in front of my face. No, I'm good. I gesture to my soda on the table, and he shrugs, before tipping his head back to take the shot. This is the last thing I want to be doing right now. This adolescent, drinking until they throw up or black out shit, may be good enough for them, but it's not for me. They haven't had the luxury of having someone's voice nagging in the back of their mind, telling them to be better, to do more with their lives. They haven't had anyone love them enough, to make them want to be better. I want to be good for you, Tess, I once told her. What a great job I've done so far. I'm going, I announce, but no one even notices as I stand from my seat and leave. I've made up my mind that I will no longer waste my time hanging out at bars with people who really don't give a shit about me. I have nothing against most of them, but in all actuality none of them really know me or care enough to. They only like the drunk, rowdy, fucking random girls me. I was only another prop at one of their massive parties. They don't know shit about me, they didn't even know that my father is the fucking chancellor at our college. I'm sure they don't know what a chancellor does either. No one knows me the way she does, no one has ever even cared to get to know me the way Tessa does. She always asks the most intrusive and random questions, what are you thinking? Why do you like that show? What do you think that man across the room is thinking right now? What is your first memory? I always acted as if her need to know everything was obnoxious, but really it made me feel special or like someone cared about me enough to want to know the answers to these ridiculous questions. I don't know why my mind won't connect with itself. One half is telling me to get over myself and take my pathetic ass to Seattle, knock down Vance's door and promise to never let her leave again. It's not that easy, though. There's a bigger, stronger, other part of me, the half that always wins, telling me how fucked up I am. I'm so fucked up, and all I do is ruin every fucking thing in my life and everyone else's, so I would be doing Tessa a favor by leaving her alone. That's the only side I can believe, especially without her here to tell me that I'm wrong. Especially since it's always proven to be true in the past. Landon's plan for me to become a better person sounds good on paper, but then what? I'm supposed to believe that I can actually stay that way forever? I'm supposed to believe that I'll be good enough for her just because I decide not to down a bottle of vodka when I got mad? This would be so much easier 
if I wasn't willing to admit how much of a fuck up I am. I don't know what I'm going to do, but the question's not going to be settled right now. For tonight, I'm going to go inside my apartment and watch Tess's favorite television shows, the worst shows, which are full of ridiculous plot lines and horrible acting. I'll probably even pretend that she's there explaining every scene to me, even though I'm watching it right next to her, and I clearly understand what is going on. I love when she does that. It's annoying, but I love how passionate she is about the smallest details. Like who is wearing a red coat and harassing those obnoxious pretty little lying girls. As I step off of the elevator, I continue to plan my night. I'll end up watching that shit, then eating, take a shower, probably get myself off while picturing Tessa's mouth around me, and I'll do my best not to do anything stupid. Maybe I'll clean up the mess I made yesterday even. I stop in front of my apartment door and look back down the hall. Why the fuck is the door cracked open? Is Tessa back, or did someone break in again? I'm not sure which answer would make me angrier. Tessa? I push the door open with my foot, and my stomach drops to the floor at the side of her father slumped over, covered in blood. What the fuck? I shout and slam the door closed. Watch out, Richard groans, and my eyes follow his to the hallway, where, over his shoulder, I catch sight of something moving. A man's there, hovering over him. I square my shoulders, and am ready to charge if need be. But then I realize it's Richard's friend Chad, I think his name is. What the hell happened to him, and why the fuck are you here? I ask him. I was hoping to see the girl, but you'll do, he sneers. My blood boils at the way this vile man refers to my Tessa. Get the fuck out, and take him with you. I gestured to the piece of shit that brought this man to my apartment. His blood is making a mess on my floor. Chad rolls his shoulders and twists his head back and forth. I can tell he's trying to be calm, but is feeling agitated. The problem with that is he owes me a lot of money, and he doesn't have a way to pay it, he says, his dirty fingernail scratching at the small red dots on his arms. Fucking junkie. I hold up a flat hand. Not my fucking problem. I'm not going to tell you again to leave, and I'm sure as hell not giving you any money. But Chad only smirks. You don't know who you're talking to, kid. He kicks Richard just below his rib cage. A pathetic whine falls from Richard's lips as he slides down onto the floor and doesn't get up. I am not in the mood to deal with fucking drug addicts breaking into my apartment. I don't give a fuck about you or him. You're sadly mistaken if you think I'm afraid of you. I growl. What the fuck else could possibly happen this week? No, wait. I don't want to know the answer to that. I step toward Chad, and he backs away, just like I knew he would. Maybe to be nice, I will say it once more, get out or I'll call the cops. And while we wait for them to show up and save you, I'll be beating the shit out of you with a baseball bat I keep handy in case some dumb fuck tries to pull shit like this. I move toward the hall closet and grab the weapon from where it leans against the wall, lifting it slowly to prove my point. If I leave without the money he owes me, whatever I do to him is on you. His blood will be on your hands. I don't give a fuck what you do to him, I say. But then I'm suddenly unsure of whether I actually mean that. Sure, he says and looks around the living room. How fucking much money? I say. Five hundred. I'm not giving you five hundred dollars. I know how Tessa will feel when she learns that my suspicions about her father being an addict are true, and this makes me want to throw the wallet in Chad's face and give him everything I have just to get rid of him. I hate knowing that I was right about her father. At this point she only half believes me, but soon she's going to have to realize the whole truth. I just wish this all would go away, Dick included. I don't have that kind of cash on me. 200, he asks. I can practically see his addiction begging me through his eyes. Fine. I can't believe I'm actually giving money to this junkie who has broken into my apartment and beaten Tessa's dad to a pulp. I don't even have 200 in cash. What am I supposed to do? Take the creep with me to the ATM? This is such fucking bullshit. Who the fuck comes home to this shit? Me. That's fucking who? For her. Only for her. I pull my wallet from my pocket 
and toss the $80 I just pulled from the bank at him and walk into the bedroom, bat still in hand. I grab the watch my father and Karen bought me for Christmas and throw it at him. For such a skeletal wreck of a human, Chad snatches it out of the air pretty deftly. He must really want it or what he can trade it for. That watch is worth more than 500. Now get the fuck out, I say. But I don't want him to leave, really, I want him to try to come at me, so I can bust his head open. Chad laughs, then coughs, then laughs again. Until next time, Rick, he threatens and walks out the door. I follow him, and point the bat at him, saying, and Chad? If I see you again, I will kill you. Then I slam the door on his ugly face. Chapter 73. Harden. I nudge Richard's thigh with my boot. I'm beyond mad, and this whole mess is his damn fault. I'm sorry, he groans, attempting to lift himself up from the floor. Within seconds he winces and slides back onto the hardwood. The last thing I want to do is lift his pathetic ass up off of the floor, but at this point I'm not sure what else to do with him. I'll put you in the chair, but you aren't sitting on my couch, not until you take a shower. Okay, he mutters and closes his eyes as I bend down to lift him. He's not as heavy as I expected him to be, especially for his height. I drag him over to a kitchen chair, and as soon as I sit him down, he bends over, wrapping his arms around his torso. What now? What am I supposed to do with you now? I ask him quietly. What would Tessa do, if he was here? Knowing her, she'd run him a hot bath and make him something to eat. I'm not doing either of those things. Take me back, he suggests. His shaky fingers lift the neckline of his torn t-shirt, something of mine, that Tessa let him keep. Has he been wearing it since he left here? He wipes the blood from his mouth, lazily smearing it down his chin and into the mess of thick hair there. Back where? I say. Maybe I should have called the police. When I first entered the apartment, maybe I shouldn't have given Chad that watch I wasn't thinking properly at the time, all I could think about was keeping Tessa out of this. But of course she's completely out of it already she's so far away. Why did you bring him here? If Tessa had been here my voice trails off. She moved out. I knew she wouldn't be here, he strains to say. I know it's hard for him to speak, but I need answers and my patience is running thin. Did you come here a few days ago too? I did. I only came to eat and sh shower, Richard pants. You came all the way here just to eat and shower? Yeah, I took the bus the first time. But Chad, he takes a breath and howls in pain, before shifting his weight, he offered to bring me here, but then he turned on me, as soon as we got inside. How the fuck did you get in? I took Tessie's spare key. He took it or she gave it to him. I wonder. He nods toward the sink. From the drawer. So let me get this straight, you stole a key to my apartment and thought you could just come here whenever the hell you wanted to take a shower. Then you bring Chad the charming junkie to my house and he beats your ass in my living room because you owe him money? How did I end up in the middle of an episode of intervention? No one was home. I didn't think it mattered. You didn't think, that's the problem. What if Tessa had been the one to come here? Do you even care how she'd feel, if she saw you like this? I'm completely out of my element here. My first instinct is to drag this old fool out of our, out of my apartment, and leave him bleeding in the hallway. I can't do that, though, because I happen to be desperately in love with his daughter, and by doing it, all I'd accomplish, would be to hurt her even more than I already have. Isn't love just fucking awesome? Well, what should we do now? I scratch a my chin. Should I take you to a hospital? I don't need a hospital, just a bandage or two. Can you call Tessie for me and tell her I'm sorry? I dismiss his suggestion with a sweep of the arm. No, I will not. She isn't going to know about this. I don't want her worrying about this shit. Okay, he agrees and shifts on the chair again. How long have you been using? I ask him. He swallows. I don't, he says meekly. Don't lie to me. I'm not a fucking idiot. Just tell me. He looks deep in thought, distracted. About a year, but I've been trying so hard to stop since the day I ran into Tessie. She's going to be heartbroken, you know that, don't you? I hope he does. 
and I certainly have no problem reminding him multiple times, if he ever happens to forget. I know, I'm going to get better for her, he claims. Aren't we all well, you may want to hurry your rehabilitation along, because if she saw you now I don't finish this sentence. I'm debating whether or not to call her and ask her what the hell I'm supposed to do with her dad, but I know that's not the answer. She doesn't need to be bothered with this, not right now. Not while she's trying to turn her dreams into reality. I'm going to my room. Feel free to take a shower, eat, or whatever you were planning on doing, before I came home and interrupted you. I saunter out of the kitchen and into the bedroom. I close the door behind me and lean against it. This has been the longest 24 hours of my life.